Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 New York City Solar and Storage Installer Workshop. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, let the rest of the registered attendees jump on. morning we're going to give it just another two minutes as everybody's gathering their maybe second cup of coffee and we'll get started with a very eventful day
Good morning and welcome to the 2022 New York City Solar and Storage Installer Workshop. Those of you who joined us right at nine o'clock got your five minutes of Zen for the day. Although you're probably checking your email, but we do appreciate all of you joining us and continuing to join us throughout the day. Uh, Sustainable CUNY has been hosting together with Con Edison, the workshops for the installers in New York City for about 15 years now. And the market continues to grow. And as you see there, CUNY is the greatest urban university in the world. That's because we are also the largest public university in, uh, in the United States with nearly 500,000 graduate and postgraduate students. And we are uh, very fortunate to have that depth of knowledge to help us unlock the solar and storage market in New York City. Uh, if we can uh, go to our logistics slide, just a couple of logistics. These are the typical questions that we get asked a lot. Um, please do submit your questions in the Q&A box. There's not a chat box, there's the Q&A box. And if there's time, our pres presenters and panelists will answer the questions live. But we do catalog all of the questions as we have in the previous um, workshops over the years. And we have written answers from the agencies, from the appropriate agencies. So it's just fine to let us know who you're directing the question to, whether it's the Department of Buildings or the FDNY and so forth. Uh, and then we will put those on um, the New York Solar Map and we will send that link around. And this workshop, you probably saw a little sign, is being recorded and we will be posting the slide decks as well on the New York Solar Map uh, along with the, the entire webinar. A quick preview of our agenda once again today. We'll be kicking it off with Sustainable CUNY Smart DG Hub and uh, a little bit about how to access all of those permitting resources that were collaboratively de developed along with technical assistance for both agencies and the industry from our ombudsman, followed by Con Edison taking a deep dive into interconnection requirements and processes and incentives. Uh, FDNY is always a, a very popular presentation in the process for solar and storage and updates to the code. We'll take a one hour lunch break at 12 o'clock. We'll leave the Zoom open and mute everybody, of course. And then if we ask you to jump back in at one o'clock uh, for the Department of Buildings, um, instructional electrical permits and material acceptance application process, uh, followed by a two o'clock panel discussion we're very excited about. We're very, um, very glad to be able to have um, this stellar lineup here from NYSEA, from the mayor's office, from NYSERDA, and from New York Best. And I want to add that throughout the day, we will be asking questions, um, and there'll be links in the Q&A box that will let you know where you can go to answer this. Now, part of our job uh, sustainable CUNY and our ombudsman is to help the industry remove the barriers, figure out what the bottlenecks are. So we really need your assistance in that. So if we um, we want to go to um, to Daniela and to kick off uh, a brief presentation on Smart DG Hub. Sure. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining. My name is Daniela Leifer. I'm a distributed generation ombudsman and the project manager of the Sustainable CUNY Smart DG Hub. I've been in this role working on our storage related efforts since early 2017. And I'll be joined by my colleague, Emily Sweeney, a solar ombudsman with Sustainable CUNY. And also part of our ombudsman team is Ron Reisman, our New York City solar programs manager. And assisting with our event today is Christina Lizzo, project coordinator and communications specialist. Just wanted to give a quick quick shout out to them as well. Uh, I'll take a few minutes to introduce the DG Hub program broadly and uh, especially the ombudsman program, which is really a central aspect of, of what we do. And we will take a short tour through our extensive library of resources that are available for uh, to support developers and installers who are active in the New York City market or looking to enter the New York City market. Um, so we hope we'll find these resources helpful, especially for those of you who might be somewhat new uh, to the New York City solar and storage market. Um, as a bit of background, Sustainable CUNY is an initiative within the Department of Facilities Planning and Construction Management of the Central Administration of the University. 
um, focusing both on sustainability and energy conservation within the CUNY campuses, and also with CUNY being a public university, as part of our responsibility to the larger community, this other arm of our work involves the efforts that we do relating to solar and energy storage under the rubric of the Smart DG Hub. So as illustrated on this slide here, the Smart DG Hub's work involves uh, a great deal of collaborative efforts uh, with city agencies, uh, as well as industry partner participants and many other stakeholders. Our role is primarily as an objective third party resource bringing together all the stakeholders to develop solutions and making sure that all the voices are, are at the table for important decision making. Tria Case, who is our founder and uh, as well as University Executive Director of the Office of Sustainability and Energy Conservation, led the development of the solar and DG Ombudsman program over a decade ago to help unlock the solar market in New York City, initially with support from the Department of Energy and now with state and city support. New York City was one of the first Solar America cities in the country, and our goal is to work hard to continue being a, a leader in this, this and other clean energy technologies. You can go ahead to the next slide. There are three elements of the Smart DG Hub's Ombudsman program. Our Ombudsman team is a publicly available resource for installers working in the New York City market, uh, as mentioned. In the last 12 months, our team has fielded over 120 requests for assistance. We provide this technical assistance to help installers with understanding and navigating the permitting process, as well as other regulatory requirements. And we're available to assist with really any issue or concern. We can be reached at smartdghub at cuny.edu. You'll see that email a lot. Um, in addition, for those of you in our audience tuning in from a city agency, you know, as a uh, trusted objective third party, the DG Hub also works closely in, con in collaboration with agencies and AHJs to help develop and streamline permitting and regulatory processes as we all work together to keep pace with rapid changes in technology. Uh, having a foot on each side of the permitting process, our ombudsmen have been able to identify challenges, anything from small bumps in the road to flat out barriers, and then work with decision makers and, and subject matter experts to suggest and, and implement solutions to streamline those processes. And then a third uh, key area of our work involves the development of resources, including guidance documents, educational materials, map tools, webinars, and more, which we will walk through over the next several slides. And uh, uh, just want to say a special thank you goes out to those stakeholders who have given us feedback on issues and processes. And for those of you from city agencies who we have put in a lot of work to prepare for today's event, and also just for your ongoing uh, collaboration and efforts uh, as we work together to advance the distributed generation market in New York City. So I'll turn it over to Emily Sweeney, who will give a bit more detail about the history of our ombudsman program and provide an overview of our solar related resources. Great, thanks Danielle. So before we jump into all the presentations and updates from New York City agencies, which will help you install more solar and storage in New York City, it makes sense to take a step back and take a look at where we've come from as an industry and market. Uh, when we started, there was less than one megawatt of solar installed in New York City. In 2006, our team at Sustainable CUNY formed the New York City Solar Partnership with the Mayor's Office and New York City Economic Development Corporation with a goal of removing barriers to solar and now storage. This led to the development of the New York City Solar Roadmap that identified key barriers to solar deployment in New York City. And over the years, our team has continued to work to remove those barriers through our grid analysis with NREL, data and policy analysis that led to the creation of the New York City property tax abatement, the formation of the solar ombudsman program, the launch of the CUNY built New York solar map and the formation of the smart DG hub. Next slide. So from where we started with less than one megawatt to today, we're on track to install a total of 300 megawatts in the coming months with over 298 megawatts of installed capacity in New York City as of February, 2022. So this growth has been fostered by all the market actions the Smart DG Hub and our ombudsman have undertaken over the years. You can see it's quite a long list and I won't name them all, but key actions like the establishment of the pro-cert permitting process for solar or the extension of the New York City property tax abatement have really helped drive the market growth and development in New York City. This chart also highlights the importance of getting state and local policies right to support growth in the market and renewable energy targets. 
Our work continues and ongoing efforts like this annual installer training are highlighted at the bottom of the slide. We expect this hockey stick growth will soon be replicated by energy storage as well. And a key web-based tool that CUNY developed to help all New Yorkers is the New York Solar Map and Portal that you can find at nysolarmap.com. Next slide. Great. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the New York Solar Map, um, but using this CUNY built tool, you're able to find the solar potential of your home or business with the calculator on our homepage. Using the map, you can also jump to different counties or regions in New York State for visualizations of solar statistics or to find a NYSERDA participating contractor. Next slide. So let's take a look at some of those data visuals and solar statistics. What we're looking at is pulled directly off the New York solar map, uh, which is utilizing NYSERDA's project data. Uh, you can select different regions or counties to focus on the data you're interested in. In this case, we're looking at the five boroughs in New York City. The gold or yellow bar on the graph or on both graphs uh, represents residential installations, while the blue represents non-residential projects. Historically, you can see that residential installations have made up the vast majority of solar installations in New York City, both by sheer number of projects and installed capacity. However, in 2021, there is a notable shift where just 307 non-residential projects or approximately 6% of the projects installed in New York City last year account for more than half of the new installed capacity. There are a number of different factors that could account for that shift, including an increase in the number of front of the meter installations like community solar. But either way, our solar statistics tool allows you to explore the data and create graphs to visualize trends. In addition to the solar potential calculator and statistics, and perhaps of most interest to our installer audience today, you have access to resources that are collaboratively developed with DOB, FDNY, and other agencies. Next slide. So these resources uh, developed with our partners cover a number of topics, including permitting, interconnection, zoning, and financing for solar energy. There's a library of reports, guides, and recordings of our past webinars. And in fact, as, as Lori mentioned, uh, we'll be adding a recording of this webinar along with responses to any questions submitted, submitted during today's workshop. Sustainable CUNY recognized the need to compile information regarding community solar. Um, and that led to the launch of our shared solar New York City gateway. Next slide. So those with a specific interest in community solar can visit the site by clicking on the Shared Solar NYC Gateway heading on the New York Solar Map. You'll find an interactive map of community solar installations in New York City. Click on each dot and you'll see the location, system size, developer, and if applicable, subscription manager. Subscribers have the option of connecting with subscriber managers who are active in New York City and host sites can connect with solar developers. As of the end of 2021, there were nearly 250 interconnected systems in the five boroughs, community solar uh, systems. Um, so although some of those systems limit subscriptions to residents of the buildings uh, they're installed on. So it's our plan to have this website serve as a marketplace for matching community solar developers with building owners who are interested in becoming site hosts and matching utility customers with community solar projects looking for subscribers. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Daniela to address uh, some of our storage resources. Okay, um, so this slide here, along with the next few, uh, comprise most of our primary storage information and resources. Uh, what you're looking at here shows our solar and storage homepage. You can find this via the solar plus storage tab that you can see in the blue navigation bar. Uh, but you can also, as you can see in the title up at the top, you can also get to this page directly via the web link, smartdghub.com. And each of the icons below are links to the primary projects that we've worked on uh, over the last several years. Our earliest energy storage work launched in 2014, focused around identifying and establishing baseline information. Where do things currently stand regarding New York City's storage related policies, regulatory requirements? What are the barriers that will need to be addressed in order to grow the market on both the local level as well as a more uh, industry -wide, wide scale? And then more recent work initiated in 2017 has 
dug into those barriers in, in, in greater depth, especially around permitting of storage system. You can go to the next slide. On the storage resources page, you can see that it's broken out into a few different categories so that you can find these resources fairly easily. Aurora is available to help guide, to provide some uh, uh, navigation guidance as well. And again, you can navigate here via the solar plus storage or the resources tab up in the blue navigation bar at the top and selecting storage resources. Our flagship New York City permitting and interconnection guide for outdoor lithium ion energy storage systems lives under this storage permitting box here on the upper left hand side, uh, along with other permitting guidance documents and checklists to help navigate specific components of the permitting process. Our energy storage roadmap and survey documents provide some higher level background information on the New York City storage market um, that's available in the uh, upper middle. While our case studies and uh, fact sheets provide educational material about energy storage more, more generally as far as the technology. Then we also have some mapping tools relating to storage, uh, lower left, as well as a page that links to previous webinars. Um, and then under this last section of additional resources on the bottom right hand side, we provide links to the latest standards and codes that are coming out from national standards making bodies, including NFPA and UL. We're always adding new resources too, and we have two new publications that just released this past December, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. You can go to the next slide. Uh, last but not least, just uh, making sure everybody knows where to find our webinar library. And whenever we do any public facing events uh, like this one, uh, but not limited to this one, we post these online for the benefit of those who couldn't attend the event or who just want an opportunity to review the material. So we will be posting this uh, event today, from today, uh, along with the accompanying document that captures the questions that we received throughout the presentation. And you can find this link via the, again, via the re resources tab in the blue navigation bar at the top and selected webinars and go to the next slide. So I hope you will all take some time to visit our resource library. Uh, and to close out, I wanted to highlight, as I mentioned, our, our most recent editions. Listed here at the top are our latest publications. The first one is the FDNY site plan checklist. This document is specific to large energy storage systems. That would be lithium ion systems over 250 kilowatt hours and other battery types over 500 kilowatt hours in an outdoor setting. So it doesn't apply across the board for all system types. Large energy storage projects require site-specific review, uh, otherwise called installation approval uh, by FDNY. So this checklist is intended to provide guidance for preparing an appropriate site plan document for that installation approval process. The second document listed here is a zoning guide that summarizes recent changes in zoning pertaining to energy storage systems. It synthesizes key information from the two zoning bulletins, the first of which was adopted in 2019, the second of which was adopted in late 2020, along with the zoning for coastal flood resilience amendment that was adopted last May. And finally, uh, we conducted a research study working with the real estate, working with real estate decision makers through our Department of Energy supported grant with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and its Solar Energy Innovation Network to identify barriers to the wider deployment of both community solar and community solar plus storage in the city. Our team assembled a, a, a pretty all-star cast of subject matter experts from the Real Estate Board of New York, Con Edison, the New York Power Authority, Underwriters Laboratory and the Electric Power Research Institute to identify what those key challenges are and recommend ways of, of overcoming them. And on our plate for 2020, oops, uh, on our plate for 2022 um, will be an updated version of our flagship energy storage publication, the New York City Permitting and Interconnection Guide for Outdoor Lithium Ion Systems. Uh, as well as guidance materials around the soon to be adopted revised PTA rule, and also guidance pertaining to the FDNY's certificate of approval process for energy storage systems. And you can go to the last slide. So with that, I'd just like to thank you once again for joining us today. And I hope the content presented during our workshop helps you install more solar and storage in New York City. 
So uh, please remember you can reach out to our Smart DG Hub Ombudsman team with questions or technical assistance requests for both solar or storage at smartdghub at cuny.edu. And you can also reach out to be added to the Smart DG Hub's New York City solar installer and energy storage roundtable email lists to, in order to receive our periodic announcements and updates. So I'm going to, at this point, pass it back to Lori to get started with the rest of today's program. All right, thank you very much, Daniela and Emily. And if I can direct everybody's attention back to your Zoom screen, if you have been multitasking, as many of us tend to do, we have a task for you. So please navigate uh, back to your Zoom screen and look for the Q&A box. And in there, you will see a link to workshop question one. If you don't see it, maybe you're not on full screen, you need to click on the more and then you will see it. Now, we asked you a few survey questions when you registered. Uh, and as always, our intent is to help grow the market. So we need your feedback. You'll see an example of the question you're about to answer on the screen right now. So look in that Q&A section. We've dropped in that workshop question number one link. It's gonna take you where you can respond to that question. What have you encountered as the most significant solar barrier? Now this survey is anonymous. Please rank in order of importance from one to nine with one being the most significant. And please don't forget to hit submit when you scroll to the bottom. Due to the large number of attendees, attendees we have today, we determined this would be the best way to engage everyone, get our finger on the pulse. So we will be taking these quick one minute question surveys throughout the day, try to give you a little warning so you make sure you make your way back to the screen. Then I'm gonna give you just a, a minute to think about those responses and then we'll, we'll move on. And if those of you are listening on recording right now, sometime in the future, if you registered, we will be sending around a link to the entire survey uh, of all the questions throughout the day. A couple of questions have come in regarding when will the webinar be posted, usually in a couple of business days, as well as the individual presentations. The Q&A take a little bit longer as we seek the uh, answers from the appropriate agency. Thank you for responding to that first workshop question. There will be more. Let me bring your attention back to the Zoom screen now if you've been on the question screen as Con Edison joins us for an in-depth look at incentives, interconnection requirements, and processes. This is going to remind you again that we'll be recording this. And please remember you can always connect with one of our ombudsmen at smartdghub at cuny.edu. So I'd like to introduce Sean Smith now. He is the Director of Distribution Planning at mm -hmm. Con Edison. Thank you, Sean, for joining us. Thanks, Lori. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, Lori, just a, a mic and a visual check. You look marvelous, and we can hear you just fine. All right. Thanks. Um, so really, really, um, you know, thanks for having us this morning. Um, very appreciative for you know, CUNY putting on this uh, workshop and inviting us to, to be a part of it. Uh, my name is Sean Smith, as, as Laurie said before, I'm the Director of Distribution Planning in the Customer Energy Solutions Organization in Con Ed. I've been with Con Ed um, since 2003, and um, I started in Con Ed after graduating from City College um, Electrical Engineering School. So shout out to CUNY. Um, I was I'm a City College alumni and definitely appreciative um, for the uh, the learning opportunities that I got at CUNY and specifically at, at City College. Uh, so as I said, I, I did electrical engineering, graduated in 2003, and I've been with Con Ed since. I'm the director in the distribution planning um, team, um, which really looks at 
uh, a lot of the DER integration that we're talking about today. And we also have some folks here from Kane that are going to be talking about some of the other programs that we have that are related um, to DER integration um, into our system. So uh, the team, you know, is really supportive of, of what's going on in a DER scale. And as uh, uh, was mentioned earlier uh, by Emily, um, in terms of uh, solar, they're about 398 megawatts. And, the, you know, the Kanye team, as well as uh, stakeholders and partners have really helped to proliferate that um, on the system. Um, and battery storage will be, you know, the next piece that we're looking at. It's currently at 18 megawatts um, in the New York City area, but we're looking to obviously push that a little bit more and, you know, make sure that we get to the goals as are designed and intended by, you know, the CLCPA. So on this slide, uh, it really just talks about, you know, the different groups in Con Ed, the internal groups. Uh, my group is a distribution planning team, as I mentioned before, um, integral to this process. And, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, really the conversation around DERs or all the other groups that you see here as well, customer operations, uh, rate engineering that's, that really works on, you know, how that affects customers' bills. Legal, obviously, metering, uh, non-wire solution, which you're, you're going to hear a little bit of today. Our demo projects, which really speaks to um, in new and exciting opportunities that we have um, that we want to sort of uh, get a, a bird's eye view into before we sort of implement. Um, we have the EV team, um, which we have representation of today as well. Utility of the future that really looks at policies and, and um, you know, state and, and federal and, and how our goals and objectives uh, are aligned with those policies, um, set us up for success. Our R&D group, which is, is important in this process and works a lot with the uh, demo group, the demo projects um, to really execute on some of the uh, creative ideas that we have. And on an engineering um, front, um, from a project management and engineering design standpoint, we have our engineering um, distribution energy services group, as well as distribution and uh, customer engineering um, which are our regional, our engineering partners, as well as our, you know, business process and technology teams. Um, next slide, please. So um, in terms of uh, what's going to be talked about today, um, we have a great agenda. Um, really want to, you know, give some more depth on the non-wire solutions uh, conversation. Uh, so Lindsay's going to go into that next. We have a program manager also associated with demand response, um, the EV team, as I mentioned before, the interconnection process, which is a, a big part of this conversation today, and then um, someone from customer ops um, that's going to be talking about, you know, give an update on our customer ops piece for solar and storage. So really great agenda um, from our folks here to share this information on all these topics. Um, also, I want to give a, a shout out to, to folks on my team and, and really the, the, um, the DG Ombudsman piece, um, Joe White, the DG Ombudsman in my group um, that is always available and, and willing to speak to, you know, folks that are, are looking to interconnect. Our email is uh, dgexpert at conet.com, or you could reach Joe White um, specifically uh, at whitejoe, that's W-H-I-T-E-J-O-E at conet.com. For any training needs for interconnect connection or any questions you or your team might have and and my team is definitely as i said before focused on der integration from our dg group which really talks about how der's are integrated to our dsp team that looks at distributed system platforms and how we're uh implementing system programs and systems and making sure that our equipment is ready um, for der integration our area station planning team that looks at, you know, making sure that our, our substations and our infrastructure is ready, um, you know, for the prolif proliferation and addition of DERs as we look toward the future and what that means from a CLCPA standpoint. Our battery storage team, which has been um, crucial in implementation of, of different battery storage technologies and really um, working with developers um, to really uh, proliferate battery integration into the program. Um, Dermis platform is another piece in my group um, that works hand in hand with distributed system platform. And we're, we're working on some Derms integration pieces uh, right as we speak 
that are really setting us up um, for success um, as it relates to FERC 2222 um, implementation, which will be in the last quarter this year. So, you know, we're working on some great things. Um, the team here is very excited uh, to have the opportunity today um, to speak to you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay uh, to go into some of our non wires solutions. Lindsay? Thank you, Sean. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Can you see me? Can I get a confirmation the video is on? Yes, we yes. can see you. Great, thank you. Um, so hi, good morning. Uh, as Sean mentioned, my name is Lindsay O'Neill Caffrey. I am the Nonwire Solutions Program Manager. And along with demand response that you'll hear after me, uh, we comprise targeted demand management. And I'm here to talk about energy storage incentives that are available in Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, next slide, please. So our current offerings for non-wires um, and a little bit of background on what non-wires are is that we're portfolios of demand reduction uh, projects designed to cost effectively defer or eliminate electric system capacity upgrades in support of formerly REV and now CLCPA goals. Uh, so non-wires has been pretty integrally, uh, you know, built into our utility capital planning process with new projects assessed on a pretty much constant basis. We have two open active areas now, I think, most people on this call who have been working in the DER space for a while are familiar with our largest portfolio, which is the Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Program. Uh, that's actually been around since 2014. We've also launched the Newtown Program, which you can see is the lightly green color on the map above the two blue shades, which uh, are the Brooklyn-based portfolios and also include Water Street. And these basically are, are designed to transfer, uh, you know, responsibility for delivering on capacity obligations from the utility to customers through incentives, which we provide for energy storage. Um, so our two portfolios right now are BQDM and Newtown. And we actually just closed our first non-wire solutions program, which was Water Street, which eliminated a cooling and reconductoring project at one of our stations. Um, and that was a project that actually led to one of the first rooftop lithium ion projects being built in New York City, which is on the roof of the Barclays Center and was operational as of last year. Uh, next slide, please. So what we do with the non-wires is we utilize a portfolio-based approach, and I'll get into a little bit of what that means, but try to focus predominantly on energy storage. And that's effectively looking at our current demand, our 10-year forecast demand, and what the capacity expansion is needed at the local level. And then we work to combine a various uh, assortment of either DERs, which in the past have included fuel cells, CHP, and energy storage, as well as a little bit of solar in a microgrid situation, and energy efficiency where practical. Um, and the goal is to effectively, you know, shift the entire overload period to ensure that we have ongoing reliability at a local level. Next slide. So this is sort of the, the suite of, of offerings that we have. I know, obviously, this is very much geared towards energy storage, but I did think it was useful to show that we've really worked over the past few years in every different uh, customer vertical. And we've tried to, you know, sort of meet the market where it was going. And so we've worked for... Uh, you know, previously uh, dual fuel or combined heat and power fuel cells, and now we're largely focused on energy storage. So we do supplement our portfolios with energy efficiency. And energy storage can be found from the residential one to four family home. We have a pilot that's launched right now to deliver that in areas of Queens, up to uh, a four megawatt system that we have, and we have a few larger systems than that currently in construction. Uh, and that's sort of where we're going in the future. And so there will be ongoing incentives available to meet those operational needs. Uh, next slide. So what does it sort of mean to have energy storage within non-wires? Uh, we procure grid connected or load following, so front of the meter, behind the meter systems to support the local distribution grid during the hottest peak times of the summer. Uh, so if you're doing a behind the meter system, you could do customer services where you actually are able to sort of sell demand charge reductions. You can have resiliency and backup power applications when paired with, you know, alternative generation sources. We've seen both solar and fuel cells, and we see a lot of people trying to target retail energy arbitrage. Um, for the system needs, you know, we're really focused on customer sided solutions. We don't really uh, care so much is where the meter is, but we do require a four hour minimum dispatch through di or a dynamic dispatch in case we need to sort of shift that four hours based on system conditions. And all of our systems must be interconnected in accordance with the SIR with one caveat on non-wires, which is that it must be connected 
to the reliability standard that is local to the area of the site. Meaning if you are connecting to overhead versus underground, there are gonna be two different obligations that you have there. And if you have any questions on what that means, happy to have me or someone from the team walk you through specifically why we have those obligations. But effectively we are trying to build batteries that are as reliable as the local conditions on the grid. Uh, next slide, please. And so when it comes to sort of what we can actually provide you in exchange for building these systems, uh, we contract for first dispatch rights. We provide the same 21 hour advance notification as demand response. And that spans uh, as a call window period from May to September through 10 year performance contracts. Um, our current contracts are split up to be 50% incentive at operational date. We've sort of made that a trigger point of permission to operate from the utility once successfully interconnected. And then a 5% annual year over year summer performance. And that's based on the actual ability to dispatch when called upon. Um, we also encourage people to seek all available revenue opportunities, uh, though your obligations to non wires come first. And we really do actually encourage uh, as much revenue opportunity as we can. We currently have contracts in place with market participation leading to 75% coming back to Con Edison and 25% going to vendors. And that's a structure that we, you know, sort of employ as a way to try to drive down some of the costs for our customers who help fund these projects. And then, uh, you know, our, it buys down not only the customer obligation, but it elongates the period of time our budget can extend to fund more projects. Um, while under contract within non-wires, Energy storage systems are not eligible for demand response or DLM uh, incentives while uh, in that 10-year term, though we have had projects in the past that have you know, terminated their contracts after the full 10 years or in the past for Gateway three years and have entered into other obligations. Next slide. And that's basically it for non-wires. Um, we have a, a, a lot of different projects that we're scoping. We're constantly looking for new opportunities throughout the entire service territory, though we have historically worked predominantly in Brooklyn and Queens. So please keep out a look for any upcoming, uh, you know, RFPs or market solicitations for energy storage. And you can find that uh, very easily at conned.com slash neighborhood, or you're welcome to email dsm at conned.com with any specific questions and I'll get back to you. Um, with that, I think that's it for non-wires and I will turn it over to Marlon Argueta for demand response. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Lindsay. Uh, so my name is Marlon Argueta. I am the demand response manager at Con Edison. I'm here to talk about, or well, to give an overview of some of our demand response programs. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so just a, a quick, quick, quick overview of, of who typically enrolls in our in our in our programs. And so there's, there's a variety of different customers that enroll, and some of the strategies that these customers use to enroll are uh, via load reduction or using distributed generation in the form of whether it's batteries, diesel, or, or gas fire uh, equipment. Uh, for load reduction, uh, there are folks that may have uh, the alter the HVAC systems. Um, set points, they may turn off lightning, they may uh, put some of their equipment uh, out of line when they do participate in uh, demand response. So there's a, there's, there's a variety of ways you can uh, reduce your consumption when we call you to, uh, to respond to these events. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> now, uh, so those were the strategies to uh, participate in th that most of our customers use in to participate in DR, but what are the requirements and what's the minimum uh, pledge that you can uh, you can provide to, to us during um, in, in this program. So first, the the main requirement to participate in DR is that you must have a, either a legacy interval meter or an AMI meter. Now in the past, only larger customers received legacy interval meters at no cost. So smaller customers had to pay for interval meters if they wanted to participate. So that was a major barrier for a lot of our smaller customers, that includes residential customers as well as, as small businesses. And so with the deploy, with AMI deployment, the opportunity of basically every customer to participate uh, is there now without with, with no additional cost. So anyone who has an AMI meter is eligible to participate as a result of our uh, Con Edison's uh, capital investment in smart meters. The second requirement is to be able to provide at least 50 kilowatts of reduction as a direct participant. And that means that you say uh, contract with us, uh, not contract, but you enroll directly with Con Edison 
or you can provide less than 50 kilowatts by working with a, an approved aggregator. Now, approved aggregators are third-party vendors who aggregate customers in networks and they enroll those customers into our programs uh, as an aggregate. And so they also provide additional energy services and there are, we have several aggregators that are approved in uh, to participate in DR. Uh, next slide, please. So now just high level, um, and, and by the way, any questions that you may have after this, this presentation, you can uh, you can find a lot of information at conedison.com slash DR, or you can contact us directly at demandresponse at coned.com. So just high level, we have two main programs. These are uh, programs that are in the tariff. So these are, we call it the Rider T programs. Our first program is our commercial system relief program. And these two are some of the largest programs, by the way. Uh, and our CSRP program is a system-wide program. And we consider that a peak reduction program. And our, the goal of this program is to reduce peak in our networks. Uh, we have different triggers. We provide 21 hours of not notifications. Uh, and as you can see, there, there are some very specific triggers to call the program. However, uh, you do have access to all this information the day ahead. So you, you, you have a sense of when uh, you might be uh, called on the program. The second program is our distribution load relief program. And that is a contingency program. And unlike CSRP, we do not dispatch this system wide. This is called uh, by network. So when there's essentially something happening in the network, that's when we're likely to call uh, an event. Uh, <clears throat> and next slide, please. Now, in addition to our CSRP and the LRP programs, we now have uh, two new programs that are very similar to CSRP and the LRP and sort of combine elements of the two. And the main difference of these two programs, which we call term and auto DLM, is that unlike rather T programs, CSRP, DLRP, where you, you enroll customers each year or as a direct participant, you enroll every single year. So you're required to participate from uh, your commitment starts on May 1st and goes all the way to September 30th. There is no contract. You signed up every year. With term and auto DLM, it's a bit different. So we're looking for long-term DR contracts in, in a way similar to no wire solutions. Uh, and we're looking for aggregations uh, uh, of customers or, or, or single customers. And what happens here is that we procure, uh, we competitively procure these long-term contracts by issuing an RFP. So unlike Rider T that you can come to, to our program by signing up and become, or through an aggregator or through Con Edison here, you have to submit a, a bid and you, and you go into, if awarded, you would go into a contract of three to five years, depending on what you specified in your bid. So you have the option of three, four, and five. Uh, and the goal here is to provide a single per KW incentive for each of you of your bids, and that determines the total price of the contract. Uh, so that's the main difference between these two programs in terms of the, the logistics. Uh, Rider T, CSRP, DLRP, one year commitment, uh, term and auto DLM, three to five year contracts. Next, please. So just a, a big overview, term DLM is really uh, also a day ahead peak shaving program and it's, it is very similar to CSRP. The main difference is that we have uh, a different trigger. So in CSRP, uh, we say that we call the program uh, when we hit 92% of the summer forecasted peak for that summer. So engineering, uh, for, our, our forecasting groups put out a, a forecast for the summer and say, okay, this is the forecast for this, for, for this summer. We take 92%, we share that with our aggregators in, in our system. So everybody knows what the 92% trigger is. Uh, and on, unlike CSRP, this program uh, gives us the flexibility to call it a, a lower threshold, which is 88%. Um, then we also have auto DLM, which is a combination of CSRP and DLRP. We can call it day ahead, we can call the program day ahead, or we can call this program for contingency reasons. And, the main difference with DLRP is that we provide at least 10 minutes of notification. So 
it's a very fast, you have to respond very fast. So you only have 10 minutes, uh, at least 10 minutes. We can call it you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but uh, that's, that is the main requirements. And I should add that another difference between uh, CSRP and DLRP and uh, term and auto DLM programs is that we do have penalties for non-performance in these two programs. Unlike CSRP and DLRP, you, you, you get, in CSRP and DLRP, you get paid for performance. So if you perform, you get paid. If you don't, uh, you don't. Uh, here, uh, there, is a there are minimum requirements of performance that are much higher than CSRP and DLRP, and there are also penalties associated with non-performance. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to, that was, that was all for me. Again, if you need to contact us, you can reach us at demandresponse at coned.com. And also you can uh, get a lot of this information, more details at conedison.com slash dr. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass this to Kevon. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, video and sound check, can everyone hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevon Brown. I'm one of the senior specialists for the e-mobility and demonstrations team here at Con Edison. I'm going to be talking to you about a little bit today about the EV Power Ready program provided by Con Edison. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about the program, the Power Ready program is an incentive program that's designed to encourage the adoption and the growth of the EV, EV infrastructure market throughout the Con Edison service territory. Uh, so we, we've been tasked by the Public Service Commission to uh, hit a, a goal of having approximately 19,000 level two uh, plugs installed by 2025 and approximately 500 DCFC plugs installed by 2025. And by the way that we're going to complete that initiative, we have a $234 million incentive fund that's designed to offset the infrastructure and customer, customer side cost when building on the EV project. Uh, next slide, please. So everything to the left of the eligibility line is where our incentives are covering. So just to just take a quick dive, um, usually the first order of business when uh, looking to install EV chargers, uh, if any panel upgrades are needed, uh, if a step of transformers needed, if the owner elects to have those uh, those chargers installed on a separate meter, though the cost of uh, those, uh, those instructional costs can be covered by our incentive program the conduit that needs to be run, the wiring that needs to be installed, the design cost, the permits, the, the cost of permits, these costs as well can be covered by our incentive program. And of course, um, every EV project has different shapes and sizes. So if there's utility side work from Con Edison that needs to be done to provide additional load, though the cost of uh, that work can be covered by our incentive program as well. Uh, what I do wanna highlight is what's not covered by our program is the cost of the EV charger itself. Uh, but the cost of the infrastructure, um, upgrades, wiring, um, those things is where our incentives are aimed at covering. Next slide. And just to reiterate, uh, reiterate that not only just the physical labor um, or material that goes into a project is where our incentive is covering, but also the project management cost, the coordination that goes into a project as well. Um, just want to highlight that those costs are covered. And, um, and just on the other side of this, just want to just highlight just some of the items that are not covered that are ineligible. And those, and those items are just specific to the charger itself. Uh, next slide. Um, so just to co cover just the two main categories of chargers that our incentive program is covering are level two chargers and DCFC uh, fast chargers. Um, the main difference is that the level two chargers, uh, they operate off a 240 volt and they usually have an output, a power output of anywhere between seven to 19 kilowatts worth of power, which usually gives a vehicle a full charge in just about six to eight hours, depending on the output. And these charges are ideal for multifamily locations, um, commercial buildings, workplace locations, or any locations where the dwell time of the vehicle will be about an hour plus, for example, shopping centers. And for uh, fast chargers, um, they're a lot more robust, a lot, very high powered. So they operate off a 480 volt transformer. Um, because of the output power, they can give a vehicle a full charge in just about 30 minutes. And so because of their power, um, they're usually ideal for short stops, uh, highway routes um, along the I-95. Uh, just want to just highlight a few key, uh, key elements when embarking on an EV project is that 
for level two and for DCFC, the minimum amount of plugs that a project needs to have to qualify for our funding is a minimum of two plugs. And that can either be done by two single port chargers or one dual port charger. So that's just a baseline minimum. And when it does come to level two, um, there we don't have a maximum. So if your project calls for 10, 20, 30 uh, chargers, as long as they're level two, um, that is acceptable. Uh, when it does come to DCFC chargers, because they're just so high powered and, and, and very robust, uh, 10 or more needs to go under additional review from our engineering team. Uh, next slide. So uh, just by the nature of the, uh, the, pro, uh, the incentive program, the Public Service Commission has uh, outlined two main categories for our, our, our funding structure, whether the chargers are located on a publicly accessible site or a non-publicly accessible site. Uh, publicly accessible simply means that the EV driver does not have to pay to get access to the chargers. For example, chargers located at a shopping, uh, shopping center uh, where you can just drive right in, that'll be deemed as publicly accessible. Chargers that are, for, a, for example, a multi-unit building or a workplace location just for the operations of that building, that'll be non-publicly accessible. So the two tiers are uh, up to 90% funding and up to 50% funding respective, uh, up to 90% for public, up to 50% for non-public uh, projects. And um, uh, by the nature of, the, uh, of our incentive program, um, it allows to, for uh, the owners of those projects to either go with non-proprietary plugs or to be able to co-locate proprietary with non-proprietary plugs as long as the number of plugs that are proprietary and non-proprietary are equal or a greater number of non-proprietary plugs for that project. Uh, next slide. Um, so here, just is just an example of our um, EV load capacity map. Uh, this is just a high level view of just the load that is used in the immediate area uh, that you're looking to have your project. So with the capacity map, we do provide this as a resource link um, where you can simply put in the address of your, of your, of your structure or project or residence. Um, and they'll be able to give you just the uh, high level of the load that's being used in the area. Now, we just wanna just provide a very quick disclaimer that this is not to be a definitive um, a, uh, answer as to what the load that's being used in the area. This is just to provide a high level. Um, any load or serviceability is always conducted by our engineering team, but this is just a good resource to show the available load or load that's being used in your area. Uh, next slide. Um, so just a, just a few um, requirements uh, for the program. Just wanted to just level set with the three main um, entities that will engage with the Power Ready program. The first entity is Con Edison, which is providing the, the incentive funds. Um, we have our site host, which is our customer or uh, end user that's purchasing the project. And then we have our approved contractor, uh, which is also known as a participant, which is handling the correspondence uh, between the customer and Con Edison, and of course, handling, handling the lion's share of the project of getting it installed and completed. Um, the benefit of the Power Ready program is that we do provide, by the assistance of the joint utilities, um, there is a web page that provides a list of approved contractors that are participating in the program that can conduct EV projects and, and um, start, provide the consultation and complete a project. Now, if you are a customer, you are owner of a business a building and you are looking for a contractor to actually do the work, you can always go to the joint utilities webpage to find an approved contractor. If you already have an, a contractor that you work with and you would prefer to use them, they can actually go to the joint utilities webpage and register to become an approved contractor so they can now bring your project into the program. We do provide all resource links to be able to register to submit a project, to start a project. And we also do provide the support of moving a project through each stage in the life cycle. Um, one thing I just want to uh, mention is that there is a uh, binding contract, which is our program agreement. The purpose of the program agreement is to basically outline what the funding is going to be provided from Con Edison, um, uh, providing also the agreement that the contractor will, will conduct the work and complete it to the way that it was described and that also it allows the incentives to be paid out once the project is complete. Um, as I already mentioned, the minimum amount of plugs that do need to, um, uh, need to be had for a project is two. Um, as for DCFCs, as I mentioned, uh, fast chargers, 10 or more do need to uh, go through additional engineering review. Next slide, please. 
And I uh, just want to just go over a few benefits of being an approved contractor uh, for the uh, for the uh, joint utilities and participating in the power ready program uh, just one key item i want to highlight is that we do have our monthly installer calls uh, so this is where we invite all of our participants all of our developers that are looking to get into the, that are either in the industry looking to get into the industry wanting to be a part of the power ready program we provide program updates industry updates uh, we provide trainings um, and, um, and specialized up, and specialized trainers and updates uh, regarding as the program evolves and as the industry evolves. So just want to provide that as a great resource that uh, once you come on come on board, uh, we do foster the environment to help you know increase the knowledge base and increase uh, you know increase participation across the board with developers and contractors throughout the uh, New York City market. Um, next slide, please. Um, and just from a few operational requirements, uh, so one thing I just want to highlight is that um, the chargers need to be remain operational uh, majority of the time, in this case, 90%, 95% of the time. And what that just really means is that it needs to be operational during the, uh, the hours of operation of that business. So for example, if a business operates um, between nine and five, then those chargers need to be available and operational during that nine to five period. If that business is 24 hours, and of course, the charges will need to be uh, operational available during that time frame as well. Um, also, once the charges are installed, they need to remain operational for a minimum of five years. And during that five year period, they are subject to quarterly reporting. Um, we, uh, for, for the purpose of the program and modeling, we want to gain the analytics on how these charges are being used. So, for example, uh, number of sessions for the day, length of sessions, um, information such as that. Now to, co to be able to collect this data, uh, Con Edison has partnered with a third party uh, consulting firm, which will be collecting the data from our uh, participants um, each quarter. And they, uh, participants will be able to provide all the analytic, analytic data to the consultant and be able to satisfy the, the reporting aspect. Uh, the benefit is, is that the majority of the charges in the EV market now um, are network capable, where they do provide a virtual back end office that um, catalogs this information and allows it to be provided to our consulting company to satisfy that reporting aspect. Um, to get additional information about the different uh, chargers um, and manufacturers that are network capable, we do provide a resource link um, that can be obtained through our, our inbox, uh, which is evmrp at conned.com to receive all information or resources regard regarding the program, and specifically that resource link uh, for a nice certis list of um, registered manufacturers that are network capable. Uh, one last item I just want to highlight here is ownership of the EV charging stations. Now, uh, through maybe during somewhere during that five-year period, uh, ownership may change of those chargers. So the owner of the business may sell to a different business owner. And so ownership can be transferred to the new owner. Um, simply just make uh, the Power Ready program team members aware so we can update that information in our database just to make sure that um, the project stays in compliance. And also too, even though ownership does change, um, the operating requirements do stand, still stand. Um, next slide, please. And this just provides a little bit more um, outline of some of the information that we're looking to collect. So um, as I mentioned, number of session dailies, daily, uh, start and stop time of each charge, um, some of the financial information we would like to you know, collect as well, uh, infrastructure and equipment cost, fee structure, uh, for the actual charging session or charging as a service. Um, so things of that nature. This information can always be provided per, uh, upon request um, from, uh, from the EV team. Once again, evmrp at coned.com. Uh, next slide, please. And I just want to also uh, cover just a few other incentive programs that can be layered uh, with uh, the Power Ready incentives that are, are being provided. And so we have our Smart Charge program, which is really great. This is geared towards EV drivers specifically. So if you're an EV owner, Con Edison right now is providing incentives um, for charging your vehicle during off-peak times. Um, resource information and how to participate in this program can provide it as well. Uh, and then we also have our business incentive rate and DCFC per plug incentive. Uh, these two specific incentives are geared towards DCFC projects. And basically, these are incentives that are, go, that are applied directly to the Con Edison bill itself. 
uh, due to the uh, to the cost that uh, the, the increased cost that can be incurred from DC fast chargers. Uh, with the business incentive rate, we're applying uh, uh, approximate 35% discount or reduction towards the kind of this and bill based on the usage of those DCFC chargers. Um, there are more details to follow to, to provide to get additional requirements. Uh, once again, you can always reach out to the uh, Power Ready team. And the similar to the DCFC per, per plug incentive, these are incentives that are uh, provided annually based on the consumption and the charges that are um, that are accumulated from the usage of DC fast chargers. Uh, next slide, please. And I want to just talk a little bit about future proofing. So this is a good tool if um, you are ready to embark on an EV project, but maybe due to uh, structural, uh, uh, it, uh, maybe due to a, a reason where you cannot install all the charges at that single moment, we do provide you with the option where you can install some charges now and the remainder later. Um, or install part of the instruction now and the remainder later. And so basically we would you know, have your award mount. And in this example, um, to install approximately four, install four chargers, the award mount would be um, $100,000. And then, so that will be provided to cover the cost of the initial infrastructure being upgraded, you know, whatever, whatever can be provided on the first or the initial uh, construction. And then for the remainder, uh, we will provide a 10% of the initial award to cover the remainder. So in this example, uh, the initial amount is 100,000, 10% of that will be 10,000. That will apply to future proof and to cover the remainder of the infrastructure for that designated project. Um, next slide, please. And this just provides a quick um, high level of the uh, life cycle of, for a project coming into the program and reaching completion. Uh, so we do have our Salesforce uh, portal. This is where we capture the project, capture information such as address, location, and it also allows you to provide the, the scope of work. So electrical one-line diagram, details pertinent to, for the engineering, the, our engineering team to, do, to conduct what's called uh, an assessment and provide a ruling. And so this ruling, um, will allow the participant and to know whether there's sufficient load available for this project and in a perfect world there's sufficient load and this will and then after that is completed the participant um, will have the ability to submit um, the cost of the project the cost will be submitted via our, our, our cost template our program team will review those costs and begin the incentive determination process once that is complete, we'll provide the program agreement um, to the participant and the participant will be able to discuss with the client. Um, as long as everything is agreement, the program agreement is signed, uh, construction can begin. And assuming that there's no util utility side work, we'll move right to work verification. Um, and if there is uh, utility side work is done once the initial construction is done from the contractor or our participant, then Con Edison will, our, our utility team will go out to com, uh, complete whatever utility side upgrades and energize the project. After that is complete, then we'll move on to work verification where we'll actually come out and um, just confirm that the work was done to the way that it was described. After that is complete, um, any final closeout documents that is needed will be provided and that will allow for incentive payment where the incentive payment actually goes to the participant um, which will, again is the developer that is handling the lion's share of the workload, which is the correspondence between the customer and Con Edison, and also to providing any um, details regarding the project and of course completing the actual installation. And um, so after the incentive payment is provided to the participant, lastly will be the quarterly monitoring to satisfy the remainder of requirements for the program. Uh, next slide. And lastly here, um, these are just uh, program resources that we do provide. Um, just as a few key takeaways here is that any of these resource links, uh, whether it's to register for our Power Ready portal, to submit a project, to get information on different resources, you can always reach out to us um, for the Power Ready program, um, evmrp at coned.com, as you can see below. And um, just wanted to just close with um, forecast. Our forecast does indicate that EVs will be responsible for one third of all car sales by the uh, by 2025. And just to show, just to share one last takeaway, um, the Power Ready program has seen great success. Uh, we've seen an uptick of over 700 projects, actually over a thousand projects, come into our program um, throughout the entire. Um, 
reconnaissance service territory. And that is pretty much all for the poverty program. Thank you so much. I'll be uh, passing it over to my colleague now, Susan Koch. She's gonna talk a little bit more about the interconnection process for electric vehicles. Good morning, everyone. My name is Suzanne Koch. Thank you, Kevon, for your great presentation. Um, I've been working at Con Edison for 18 years now, and I'm a senior specialist in the Distributed Energy Services Department. And currently, I'm working with the small residential solar cases as well as electric vehicle projects. So today, I will walk you through our EV process. Next slide, please. So first you will submit an application using one of our web portals. Many of you are familiar with these programs and have already been registered for access. The first one is Salesforce. This portal is to be used in order to file your case if it's eligible for the Make Ready program. The second portal is the Project Center and it is for all other EV applications that do not qualify for that Make Ready program. Next slide, please. Next, you will submit your preliminary documents you will be asked to upload the customer letter of authorization, site plan, one line diagram, load letter, and the EV charging station equipment cut sheet. If you're filing for the Make Ready program, you will also need to submit the Make Ready program application review letter. Next slide, please. Once the application is complete, we will review the project and progress it through to the service determination phase. This is where our engineering team will review the requested loads and the existing service to determine what work is needed in order to accommodate your request. The most common outcomes are that engineering rules this service adequate where no additional work is required, and in some cases only a meter is needed, or the existing service is adequate, but you're requesting a new point of entry. The second um, engineering outcome could be service not adequate where we need to reinforce the existing service or an upgraded service is required. The next three slides will give you a pictorial overview of the EV process. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, you will submit your application and within 10 business days, we will review it and accept it along with the customer uh, and send it along to customer engineering. Customer engineering has 30 days to review your case and reply with a ruling. If the case is ruled adequate, you can proceed with your equipment installation and interconnection. Next slide, please. Here you will see that the service is ruled adequate and a meter is required. This addition will, will add approximately 15 days onto your project timeline. Next slide. And this is the final illustration where the service has been ruled not adequate. An additional 90 days is added to this project timeline for construction, as well as an additional 45 days for interconnection after you pass your final inspection. Next slide, please. You might notice that this slide is a lot more detailed than the process. This diagram illustrates a project where this customer requires the transformer vault to be installed in the New York City sidewalk. You can see here that there are multiple layers of approvals as well as multiple requirements, which can complicate the project for both the developer and the utility and ultimately can lengthen the timeline for your installation. Next slide, please. Some additional um, items to consider here are your pro that, that may impact your project timeline, could be your load requirements and how much power is needed to support your installation. You can also take note that the load submitted may not be proportional to the available supply. For example, if you decide to change the load submitted, it might not impact the ruling. Also, there are some geographic considerations that you may need to take a look at. We have um, some, some holiday embargoes and moratoriums and construction complications with permitting that can prohibit the utility's ability to obtain permitting to dig during certain time periods. In addition to pop-up embargoes such as marathons and parades, there's also a holiday embargo that runs from Thanksgiving into the new year that pro prohibits us to do planned work um, in certain areas within the Con Edison territory. And then finally, there may be some environmental concerns that you need to consider including existing soil conditions, soil bearing capacity, and whether or not it's contaminated or if any special handling is required. 
an additional permitting requirements could be tree permits or um, permits required by the MTA or the DEP. Next slide, please. So finally here, I've provided you with some additional resources in order for you to have support with your projects. You may reach out to our manager, Richard Vitolo, using his email at vitolor at conad.com. Additionally, I've included the Blue Book link where you would use this to provide detailed information regarding your um, service work, such as property line manhole sizing, metering requirements, and also there's a library of specifications for co customer contractor use. There's also a link for our Con Edison rates and tariffs. There's a link for the electric vehicle information. And there's also a link to the electric vehicle make ready program. If you have any questions for us, please feel free to reach out. We are always here to help. Thank you for your time. Next up is Renan Carnell, who will give you an update from customer operations. We go to the next slide, please. Uh, can you turn up your sound, please? We can't really hear you very much. Can you hear me now? A little bit better. Might just have to speak very clearly into your mic. How about now? Yes, there you go. Thank you. Okay, great. I'll use this microphone then from the camera. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so my name is Ranan Corno. I'm a project manager in our customer operations department. Um, I've been with Con Edison for 10 years, um, including being in groups such as the distributed generation group and utility of the future. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some new tariff compensation options for both solar and storage. These are topics that uh, we touched on in the last uh, the last installer workshop a year ago. Um, but since then, these have now come into fruition, are in our tariff, and are available for customers uh, to, to enroll into. Um, additionally, I'm going to talk about a new um, surcharge for mass market solar customers, as well as certain other eligible customers um, that may apply to your customer base. If we can go to the next slide, please. And so the first one I'm, I'm going to talk about is remote crediting. And this is the successor for the value stack remote net meter tariff. Um, for those that might, might be clued into our, uh, the, the history of remote net metering, uh, that started in the mid 2010s, I think about 2014 or so. And um, it, it was really designed for, um, for a single customer to, to provide excess credits to their other accounts. And that has since changed and there's a, a more dynamic way for customers to monetize the excess generation from, from, an, uh, from a generator. So uh, last year, we implemented the remote crediting tariff. This is available for all new um, value stack customers as well as uh, all, all remote net, net meter customers automatically transitioned to the remote crediting. And um, this took place, our tariff was effective September 1st. And on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about what the differences are um, with this remote crediting tariff. Um, so let me first uh, explain some of the differences between remote net metering and remote crediting. Uh, I mentioned that remote net metering was generally designed for a single customer that had multiple sites. They ha have a generator on one facility and are able to virtually um, apply the excess generation to the other facility. Um, that's illustrated on the diagram on the left. We see there's a building owned by ABC company with a generator and it's able to provide credits to an affiliated account within our service territory. We're calling that here uh, another ABC company location. Under remote crediting, multiple unrelated customers can participate in the same project. So there's no longer a requirement that the off takers are under the same um, entity as the host project. Uh, for those familiar with the community distributed generation program, in a ways this is very similar, where there's a host, um, they have a relationship with other subscribers and they can provide credits to those customers. Um, so here on the diagram in the middle, uh, we see the, an illustration of this um, crediting arrangement where the host project allocates their monthly excess energy 
to a variety of uh, other accounts that are both, they can be related or unrelated to the, to the um, host account. Um, now that the remote crediting project is limited to up to 10 customers as off takers. However, each customer can have any number of unrelated, uh, sorry, of related um, satellite accounts. Uh, effectively, if they are in the same name as, um, as that customer. So for example, here uh, in the, this diagram, we see that there are actually um, two customers participating. There's ABC company and XYZ company. And, and it just so happens ABC company has two satellites and XYZ has a single satellite. Um, another major difference, um, I, I touched on this, is that credits are allocated as opposed to remote net metering. Um, previously under the remote net metering arrangements, credits um, were kind of cascaded in billing order to accounts because they were the same customer, we just applied them to the satellites as they build. Under remote crediting, very similar to the community distributed generation program, credits are specifically assigned to, to satellite accounts. Uh, so you would provide us, as I'll show you later, with an allocation request um, designating the, the credits. Um, so you might find this arrangement particularly uh, beneficial for both uh, solar as well as storage, uh, because you can cite a resource that uh, may at times or complete or at all times export to the grid, and you can monetize that energy by allocating it to other subscribers and having an, a billing arrangement with those subscribers to recover your revenue. Um, it's not required that you fully allocate all the credit. You are able to uh, quote unquote bank the credit and um, allocate that at, at a future time if you're building up a subscription base. Next slide, please. Uh, the way that you, you um, enroll into this program is through um, the Power Clerk system as you submit your interconnection cases through Con Edison. Um, specifically, there'll be a, a a question asking about the, the compensation type in the in form G. And along with that election, you'll submit an, an allocation file. And this designates who your 10 up to 10 customers uh, up to are and each of their satellites. So here we have a, just a snapshot of what that allocation file um, looks like. There are some other fields, but I'm highlighting the, the important ones right here. Um, so here we see you designate the customer name. Um, in this case, we have three customers participating in total across this project. Uh, there's Acme Corporation, Stark Industries, and Wonka Chocolates. And each of those customers can have any number of satellites. In this case, this Acme Corporation uh, has both a headquarters and a warehouse, and both those facilities count as one customer, but they each need to have a specific allocation assigned to them, as you can see on the last column on the right. Um, Similar to our CDG or Community Distributed Generation Program, allocations can be submitted um, monthly with 30 days notice. Next slide, please. Another new program we've started this year is called Net Crediting. And this is for Community Distributed Generation. It's not available for the remote crediting program that I just described. Uh, but Community Distributed Generation is another program available for both solar storage and combinations thereof. Uh, that uh, effectively has the utility collecting subscription fees and remitting payments to CDG sponsors. The CDG program, in contrast to the remote crediting program, has higher incentives potentially available for uh, subscriber for, for the uh, projects. Uh, but it also comes with certain other requirements, um, which are not a topic of this presentation, but which you can find in our tariff. As part of the net crediting program, uh, the subscription fee is determined as a percent of the credit. Um, so if your example, uh, so, for, uh, so for example, if a subscriber receives a $100 credit and uh, the CDG sponsor sets a 10% savings rate, the subscriber will see 10% of that credit and the remainder uh, will, will be remitted to the CDG sponsor, reflecting the subscription fee. And that simplifies the uh, revenue collection from the CDG host perspective, and it simplifies the customer experience because a customer only receives their Con Edison bill and they don't have to receive a separate bill for their CDG subscription fee. Um, one of the state goals and our goals too is that this will increase 
low and moderate income participation in CDG programs by removing requirements for credit checks. So because the CDG entity or marketer is not performing collections, uh, instead that's on the utility, uh, the, a customer's credit score should not impact their, um, their, their credit uh, uh, capacity in, in financing the project. This program became effective last year and it is uh, under active enrollment. Both existing CDG projects and new projects can be uh, can enroll in this program and the enrollment uh, steps are also through PowerClick. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just to highlight some of the, the differences between our traditional CDG program um, available today and the value stack CDG program, just to show what's the same and what's different. Um, the subscri subscriber acquisition, finding subscribers um, within our service territory under both programs that's still performed by the CDG sponsor or a marketing agent on their behalf. The actual credits, the uh, value of the credits um, and the value of the export is the same under both programs. So both uh, under both programs, the value stack rates apply. The key difference is how the, those um, credits are, are monetized, how the generation is monetized. Under traditional CDG, all of the generation, the only way it could be monetized was by applying bill credits on subscriber electric bills. Under the consolidated billing or net crediting program, subscribers still receive a, a bill credit. However, that will be net of the CDG subscription fee. So subscribers effectively receive a partial credit uh, of the total amount available, and the utility will be re remitting a payment um, to the subscription to, to the CDG sponsor. And that really is the difference in cost recovery, as opposed to a second bill in, in billing CDG subscribers under net crediting, the utility provides the payment to the CDG host. There are um, a few new requirements as part of, oh, sorry, can we go to the next slide, please? And there are a few additive requirements for CDG net crediting, um, in addition to, to, the, to the traditional CDG enrollment process. Um, every single project, um, even if there's the same developer, we, we do need a contract for that specific interconnection, interconnecting project. Um, that's called the net crediting agreement. In addition, the actual allocation form is a bit different. Um, the allocation form includes the CDG savings rate. That's the effective savings that customers receive net of the subscription fee. And uh, CDG sponsors in under net crediting can specify up to one satellite account that is an anchor. Um, and that if they specify an anchor, that customer receives the full amount of their credit and is not participating in the CDG um, consolidated billing. And the sponsor can have their own billing arrangements um, for that, that sponsor. So if you have an anchor customer with a different pricing model than all of the other uh, customers on the account, you would specify them as an anchor. You also need your banking information so that we can make our monthly payments. Um, more rules of the program are available at the conet.com slash DG. If you click on guides and specifications, there's the net crediting manual, which spells out more details of this program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the last thing I'm gonna just touch on um, may apply to some of your customers, but I, I wanna highlight it here because this is a change for solar billing um, primarily. Um, New York State has issued uh, the net metering successor tariff, um, which adds a new monthly charge for on-site mass market net metered eligible DG customers that interconnect on or after January 1st of this year. And this surcharge recovers um, the cost of public benefit programs like um, energy efficiency, bill credits for, for low-income customers, and NYSERDA funding, including the very um, NY Sun uh, incentives that, that support solar. Um, and the purpose of this is so that uh, customers with solar and other NEM eligible technologies contribute their fair share um, to these programs that everyone benefits from. Um, this applies only for DG that installed after this year. So any, any projects that were installed prior to 2022 do not have this charge assessed. Um, and it again is only for, for mass market customers. Um, I'll go to the next slide, please. And I'll, I'll just quickly touch on what this charge is. 
It's a monthly charge. It's the product of two things, a rate and the size of the GG. Um, and it's only counting, we're only counting for the size of the GG, the net meter technologies, um, which in many cases is solar. Energy storage is not considered a net metering technology, but can be paired with, with uh, solar. So for customers that have both solar and storage uh, that go on net metering, the CBC charge is only um, counted for the solar for the solar size um, because storage does not impact uh, net consumption that much. Um, the charge is monthly. It's updated every year. And for a typical residential customer, it's just under a dollar per KW in, in 2022. And with that, I'll go to the next slide. If you have any more questions, you can contact our department at cdgdevelopers at And that's all I have. I want to thank you, everyone, for uh, attending, allowing Con Edison to, to present. Thank the other Con Edison presenters. And I'll turn it back to you, Laurie. Well, thank you very much to the entire Con Edison team. I hope that that was very informative for all of you. And again, if your questions were not answered in the course of the presentations, they will be submitted in writing to Con Edison and we'll give them a little time to turn that around and we will post that on the website. Uh, we will post the presentations uh, just as soon as we can. We won't wait for the answers there. So they'll, they'll come in a couple of different stages there. Uh, we're going to move right along to the FDNY presentation on the application processes for solar and storage, as well as the 2022 updates to the New York City Fire Code. So we're going to kick that right off as soon as um, that presentation is up, and it looks like we're just about there. Thank you very much. Um, Ron's been handling our screen. Yash Patel, engineering consultant for FDNY, is up first. Thank you very much, Yash, for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is, can you go back to the introductory slide? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yash Patel. I'm part of the sustainability unit at Tech Management. I'm one of the engineers tasked with reviewing ESS applications. And I just want to thank CUNY for giving me this opportunity to present FDNY's filing process and the requirements for battery energy storage systems. Next slide. Yash, can you speak up just a little bit, please? Your voice is a little soft. All right, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank In you. Collabor is this better? Yes, thank you. In collaboration with CUNY, uh, we have worked on a permitting process guideline for outdoor energy, uh, energy storage systems that incorporate lithium ion battery technology which I have hyperlinked to the slide. Uh, from the guideline, you will see the necessary requirements and processes for filing outdoor lithium ion ESS installation. Even though the guidelines are intended for lithium ion batteries, uh, the necessary requirements and processes for filing outdoor ESS installations will follow a similar process. And that guideline I've also hyperlinked to the slide. Also hyperlinked to the slide is our Outdoor Energy Storage Rule 3RCNY608-01 and the new FDNY Fire Code. In the near future, we'll be working with CUNY to come up with a similar guideline for indoor systems and the certificate of approval process. Also, when creating submission packages for any project, please note that tech management has uh, stopped accepting paper submissions and all submissions need to be done digitally through the FDNY portal which is also hyperlinked to the slide. If the hyperlinks don't work uh, when the slide deck is released, uh, there's a reference slide at the end with the full URLs. Next slide. In the new fire code, there were a couple of changes that impact uh, battery energy storage systems. In the new code, battery energy storage systems are allowed to be installed indoors and on the premises of R3 occupancies, which were previously not allowed. The installation criteria and the possible installations will be detailed in the certificate of approval for the battery energy storage system. Also, the new code requires battery energy systems to be listed to 9542nd edition. However, if the system was tested to 9540A fourth edition and listed to UL 9540 first edition prior to the enactment of the fire code, 
2022, then the UL 9540 first edition listing will be an equivalent to the UL 9540 second edition listing and will be accepted by the fire department. Next slide. To install a new energy storage system that hasn't received a certificate of approval, the equipment manufacturer of the system would need to apply for a certificate of approval. For the manufacturer to receive the certificate of, uh, certificate of approval, they would need to file a TM2 application, which costs $625, provide cut sheets of the system components, narrative that describes the battery energy storage system, modes of operation, any incorporated safety systems, and the activation sequence of those safety systems. Installation manuals and any technical documentation. You are listing to 9540, 1973, and 1741. You will 9540 testing, uh, sorry, you all 9548 test results and a hazard mitigation analysis or a failure modes and effects analysis done by a New York licensed fire protection engineer. Also, uh, they can provide an emergency response plan that details the actions that need to be taken in, in case an event occurs. Once granted a certificate of approval, uh, developers may use such approved systems for installations across New York City defined in the certificate of approval if the conditions outlined in the certificate of approval are met. Next slide. For a developer to install a battery energy storage system, they need two things, a certificate of approval for the battery energy storage system and a TM1 for the site-specific site installation of the approval and other TM1 approvals that might be needed based on the location and the size of the battery energy storage system. When submitting a TM1 application for energy storage systems, you will need to provide a $420 application fee and a $520 $25 complex tech analysis fee, totaling $945. Site plans created by a design professional that shows the location of the ESS and any relevant in information. Narrative describing the scope of work. Cut sheets of the system components, installation manuals, and technical documentation. Commissioning and decommissioning plan, UL listings, and any information that might be relevant to the application. Uh, the TM1 application can also be submitted in parallel with the DOB application. Next slide. When designing uh, these ESS systems and choosing the location for the installation of the ESS, there are many things that need to be considered. Uh, the physical size and charge density of the ESS and what hazards it might pose. Is the ESS nearby buildings, windows, HVAC intakes, gas stations, schools? the gases that can be generated in the event that the ESS fails and goes into thermal runaway, the toxicity and the deflagration risk of those gases, which safety systems are in place to prevent battery failure and what systems are in place to control and fight the fire due to battery failure. Yes, that's right. well, no, are there sufficient hydrants in the area where the ESS is being installed? Will those hydrants be able to provide enough water? Where will the FDNY connect to or activate safety systems in the event of a failure, who will be the subject expert for the system and the certificate of fitness holder? Is there any uh, risk? Is there any uh, risk of physical damage to the ESS by motor vehicles? And how to safely dispose of the ESS after its life cycle? Next slide, please. Based on the new fire code 2022, there are three types of installations, outdoor installations, indoor installations, and installations that serve R3 occupancies that is attached in a, sorry, that is installed in an attached garage, detached garage, or mounted outdoor on an exterior wall to that R3 occupancy. For all installations, uh, the fire department needs to be notified in accordance to the fire code 608.10.3 and 3 RCNY 608-01 uh, section F3. Next slide, please. 
for R3 occupancy installations, uh, there's certain size requirements. In the new fire code, there's limitations on the size, uh, and they are as follows. For attached garages, it is limited to 20 kilowatt hours per battery energy storage system serving a single dwelling unit. For detached garages and exterior wall installations, they are limited, limited to 40 kilowatt hours per battery energy storage system serving a single dwelling unit. Uh, for the installation requirements, uh, we require that the system itself has a certificate of approval and that if uh, the requirements in 608.13 in the fire code and the conditions stipulated in, this con stipulated in the certificate of approval are met, then a TM1 doesn't need to be filed for that installation. Rather, we just need to have a notification as mentioned before. If uh, the system doesn't have a certificate of approval, then a TM2 will need to be filed and an installation will not be allowed without a TM a certificate of approval. Next slide, please. For outdoor installations, there is no size limitation. Rather, it is broken down into three different categories, uh, small, medium, and large systems. And that is defined in the outdoor rule 3RCNY 608-01. And based on the size, different requirements will be placed onto the ESS. And for the installation requirements, uh, we need to have a certificate of approval for the battery energy storage system. And depending on the size of the system, different TM1s will be needed. Uh, if it's a small system, a TM1 for the installation is not required, whereas for a medium and large, a TM1 for the installation is required. And uh, depending on, also on the size, a TM1 will be needed for the fire alarm system. And for and if any uh, non-water-based fire suppression is included inside the BS uh, battery energy storage system, then a TM1 will also need to be filed for that. And also a TM1 would need to be filed for the NFPA 15 design water spray system if uh, it's required based on the size. And just as previously for R3 uh, installations, if the battery energy storage system doesn't have a certificate of approval, then the installation will not be allowed. Next slide, please. For indoor systems, uh, the size limitations follows uh, the table that's listed in 608.9.1.1, which uh, lists maximum size based on the battery chemistry per control area. And the control area scheme follows uh, limits set forth in fire code 5003.8.3.3. For the installation uh, of indoor systems, uh, it, it will be reviewed and approved by Department of Buildings in accordance with that agency's requirements with department review of, the, the, the approval, uh, sorry, department approval of energy storage management systems, monitoring station, smoke control and smoke purge systems, explosion mitigation and such fire protection hazard mitigation systems and measures as required to be reviewed by the department. If the, if the battery energy storage system has a certificate of approval and the installation is within uh, those parameters specified in the certificate of approval and the installation meets the requirements of fire code 608.9.1 and the manufacturer requirements, then there's no need to file a TM1 with the fire department and only needs DOB approval. However, if the parameters of the installation are not within the conditions stipulated in the certificate of approval, or the requirements of fire code 608.9.1, the manufacturer requirements, then a TM1 will have to be submitted for the specific site installation. And if, uh, as previously stated, if the battery energy storage system doesn't have a certificate of approval, 
then it will not be allowed for installation. Next slide. In this slide, I've detailed uh, the steps that need to be taken to submit a TM2 application. And it is uh, critical that uh, these steps are followed and, so, and the application is submitted correctly. Because sometimes what can happen is that uh, they can submit an application on the wrong subsection and it'll go to another department. And that might slow down processing time for the application. Next slide, please. And in this slide, I've detailed uh, the steps that need to be taken for filing TM1 applications for the different applications that might be required based on the size of the energy storage system. Next slide, please. When submitting uh, TM1 applications, it is crucial to provide certain information for the review process to be efficient as possible based on the battery chemistry and the size of the ESS, information that needs to be provided will vary. For, for information related to the ESS itself, uh, we wanna see the system size, the applicable part, uh, product standards that are met, a number of battery cells in the system, the battery chemistry of those cells, the voltage, your listing, any cascading protection, Next slide. The number and types of racks in the enclosure, ventilation system if required based on the size, defecation venting if required based on the size. For the inverter, uh, we wanna see information on the size of the inverter, the type and uh, the listing for the inverter. We also wanna see what the inverter monitors any protection measures that are built into the inverter. Next slide. As part of our rule, we require all battery, uh, battery energy storage systems to have a battery management system. Uh, since not all battery management systems are equivalent, we require a description of the BMS, what it monitors, will be monitoring the output of the BMS, the information on how, oh sorry, uh, information on how the BMS can detect a failure has occurred. The steps that need to be taken if a failure is detected by the BMS. Also provide information on any other safety measures uh, that are included like gas sensors, uh, hydrogen sensors, thermal sensors, ground fault protection, Arc fault protection. Next slide, please. Despite the battery chemistry and size, uh, we require all energy storage system installations to have a process to completely shut down the system known as an e-stop. The e-stop will shut down the system in the event of failure without affecting any of the safety systems incorporated in the ESS. For the e-stop, we wanna know where is it located, who will have access to the e-stop, and what is being done to prevent unauthorized access to the e-stop. We also require all applications to have a commissioning and decommissioning plan and energy manage, uh, emergency management plan. A55, uh, sorry, NFPA A55 gives great guidance on what to include and exclude in the decommissioning and commissioning plan. For the emergency management plan, uh, we wanna see what actions are taken in the event of a failure, the responsibilities of the subject, subject matter experts and the certificate of fitness holder and the plan of action for the firefighters. Next slide, please. For uh, installations that are on rooftops, uh, we want to know the construction of the building, where the ESS is located, how will FDNY have access to the ESS, uh, the ventilation system for the entire building and the HV, HVAC intakes in the vicinity of the proposed ESS location, the water-based suppression system if required based on the outdoor rule, uh, 3 RCNY 608-01, uh, the standpipe outlet locations near the installation, emergency exit locations, 
and fire hydrant locations. Next slide, please. In this slide, I just wanted to give an overview of the typical FDNY review process for these applications. Uh, so once uh, the application is received by FDNY, it will be reviewed. And if more information is required, the reviewer will issue a letter of deficiency through the portal, which will open the application and allow the applicant to upload the requested information. Also, if needed, FDNY will contact the applicant to set up a site visit. Once all the necessary information has been provided and the reviewer sees that the conditions are met and are satisfactory, then FDNY will issue a letter of acceptance or a conditional letter of acceptance. Next slide. And in this slide, I've just given some of the contact information for uh, the department and the people inside the sustainability unit. And I will hand it off to my colleague, John. And th this was the reference art. Sorry, sorry. Um, so can everyone hear me? Just wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Loud and clear, sounds good, John. Excellent, all right. So let's get started. My name is John Gino. I'm the supervisor of the rooftop access unit, and I'm going to be going over the rooftop access requirements and going into a little bit of the operational stuff. Um, next slide, please. So like I said, we're going to go into some of the firematics and operations, discuss why we need the code. It's important to understand a little bit about why the code exists and what it's, the um, clearances are needed for. Uh, we're also going to go into the 2020 NYC fire code, specifically FC 504.4, FC 504.5, and FC 512. Um, the fire code will be coming out, be enacted in um, April 15th of this year. So it's right around the corner. So that's why we wanted to get you guys um, familiarized with it. And we're going to go into some common non compliant installations, discuss a little bit about the solutions to them, and honestly, how to file with us, because that's probably going to be your biggest thing. Next slide, please. So we're starting off with FireMax and operations. Next slide, please. So there is a saying, nothing shall deter the member assigned the roof position from carrying out their assigned duties. It means the firefighters are going to do whatever they need to to get you know up there, do their uh, duties on the rooftop, and protect life, such as rope rescues and getting onto the rooftop and explaining and um, sending in vital information down. But we need to also ensure that the rooftop conditions are conducive to those operations. That's the importance of the code. Next slide. So what are some of the requirements, what are some of the requirements of the person on the roof position? They're going to be doing a perimeter search. They're going to go to the front, the rear, the side of the building, checking shafts, checking uh, bulkhead doors, checking skylights, hatches. They're going to be looking over the sides to see windows, see if there's smoke coming out the window, see if there's fire coming out of the windows, see if there are people hanging out of the windows needing to be rescued. Um, also, they're going to be looking at the fire escapes to see if people have taken shelter on the fire escapes, and they're going to be searching the roof to see if anybody's taken shelter on the rooftop itself. They're going to be transmitting all this vital information down to the incident commander, that is the chief on site who is directing all the firefighters, not just the ones on the rooftop, but the ones in the building, doing hose operations, doing rescue operations, so it's vital that he is given all the information necessary to properly direct the resources. And finally, they're going to also be venting. Um, they're going to open bulkhead doors, break upper level windows, open skylights, open hatches, and possibly cut the roof. Um, next slide. Um, and venting is key in the early stages of firefighter operations because it's critical for relieving the upper portions of the building of heat, gas, smoke. This is, can help increase the survival time of those evacuating, those who are trapped, and those who are maybe unconscious. It also makes the rescue operations more efficient and effective. It's easier for the firefighters to move around. It's easier for them to see. Um, it also increases the effectiveness of hose operations and extinguishments and can help limit the spread of the fire. So in the diagram to the right, you can see uh, an H-type building. There may be a fire raging in one wing of it. It may be very difficult for them to control. So the firefighters may cut a trench and want to try and isolate that fire so it does not spread to the other um, wings of the building. So that's why it can be important to vent and some of these uh, rooftop operations. Next slide. So that's just a brief, brief overview of the um, what's required and why we need um, the clearances. So we're going to get into the actual code and what those clearances are. 
So again, I said the 2022 code will be effective as April on April 15th of this year. Uh, FC 504.4 deals with rooftops that are 100 feet in or less in height and have a slope of 20 degrees or less. And it includes all the rooftops on the building. Um, if you have a building with multiple rooftop levels, say in the diagram, you see a two story with a six story, um, you'll need to provide rooftop perimeter access, rooftop clearances, all the requirements of the code for each of those levels. It's not just one of them. It's not just the six story. It's both the second story and the six story. Next slide, please. So we're going to get into what those uh, accesses are. First of all, the firefighter needs to get onto the rooftop. So they're going to need perimeter access openings. So for every 12 feet of frontage space, we're going to require a six foot opening. The pattern will depend on the size of the building and shape of the building. Obviously, not every building is rectangular. As we saw, they can be H-types and other uh, configurations. And these permanent access landings must be calculated along accessible exposures. These include side streets, parking, main avenues, um, and any, basically anywhere the truck, the fire truck can pull up, the ladder truck can pull up and you know um, put up the ladder. Next slide, please. So about the actual dimensions and such about the perimeter access. The perimeter access landings must be six foot in each direction. That means six feet wide, six feet deep, and they must have a height of clearance of nine feet above the parapet and above the rooftop. Some people go, well, why the parapet? Well, because the firefighter has to traverse over the parapet. And if there's not enough clearance over the parapet, they're not gonna be able to pass the parapet onto the actual rooftop. So there needs to be nine feet of head clearance at all times. Uh, all landings must be connected to a clear path. It's essentially useless to have a landing area if you cannot you know, move around and get to other areas of the rooftop. You've landed in an isolated area. There's no way you can do, perform your operations. Fences or anything like them cannot obstruct the access landing areas. And if they are, there are fences beyond the access landing areas, um, between the access landing areas and the um, clear paths, you must provide a gate through those areas. Gates must be three feet wide, inward swinging. You may lock them, but they must be secured by a padlock and or chain that is cut all by a standard bolt cutter. Next slide. So where are your landing areas measured from? You measure them from the inside wall of the parapet. You do not include the parapet as part of your calculation because the firefighters do not stand or land on that parapet. They're going to be landing beyond the parapet. So as you can see in the picture, it's the green area. It starts from the inside of the parapet and goes back, well, ideally six feet. Um, when you may have to file with the rooftop unit, it's important that you, will in, that you indicate to us the height of the raised parapets, um, whether the parapets are decorative, and clearly indicate the type of decorative, if it is decorative, so whether it's sloped, peaked, um, if it's flat top, because that information is vital to us for determining whether or not that area is usable for the uh, apparatus successful ladder. Next slide. <clears throat> so when you might have slope parapets, the slope portion of the parapet is not considered to be part of the perimeter access landing area. You may not use the slope portion as part of your calculation. The calculation begins at the termination. So if you look at the picture, you can see that the slope parapet is not part of it. And then that red line is where the slope uh, portion terminates. And then beyond that's the flat rooftop. And from that red line back in the green area is where you can do your calculation for the six foot deep perimeter access landing area. Decorative cornices are also not considered to be usable as part of the calculation because they may not be um, structurally support, support enough to support the weight of a firefighter dismounting the ladder. So I, the firefighter will attempt to dismount beyond them, which would be um, at the termination of the facade wall on the interior of the rooftop. And that's where your calculation would begin. Next slide, please. So perimeter access obstructions to the perimeter access area won't necessarily always be at rooftop level. They can be um, below the roof line and affixed to the exterior of the structure. These can include sun control devices, awnings, solar panels, fire escapes. People go, well, fire escapes are necessary. And yes, they are, but they can still cause an obstruction. And these are because firefighters are going to attempt to not put their ladders over these areas. One, because they don't want to risk damaging them in any way, shape, or form. They don't want to risk um, people who may be trying to evacuate. Um, the burning building and may panic to be grabbing onto the ladder or try attempting to grab onto the fighter fighter in a panic. So it's um, a safety measure that they try to avoid putting the ladder right over or right directly next to these fire escapes if they can avoid it. Obviously, uh, the picture to the right, bottom right shows 
you know, the rooftop looks relatively clear. It's it's pretty open, but it has all these solar panels lying the side. While it may seem kind of open, the ladder does come at an angle. It doesn't magically just touch the rooftop. It has to come up at an angle. Therefore, it may crush these panels and these panels may be electrified. The ladder is metal and an electrified metal ladder with a firefighter on it's not a good time because the firefighter may get electrocuted. Now we have an injured firefighter and a burning building. That's not a good thing. And obviously the other picture shows signs. Signs are on the top of the rooftop obviously can cause um, some obstructions. Next slide, please. So um, while we've always tried to explain that parapets can cause an obstruction, we have officially codified it in the new version of the code. And this will help give some clarity on what is considered a parapet that causes an obstruction, what doesn't. Um, parapets or protective barriers that are four feet in height or less <clears throat> are not considered to cause an obstruction to the permanent access in the area that they're located. Um, any parapets, railings, or protective barriers constructed after the effective date of the 2022 code must be designed to be able to handle a point load of 350 pounds, have a level surface, and be a minimum of five inches wide at the top. Uh, next. So any parapet that is over four feet, say with the diagram to the right, a six foot high parapet would be considered to cause an obstruction. However, that doesn't mean it's never going to be a usable area and there's no solutions. The solution is we would require that you provide a landing platform beyond to bring the um, landing area that the platform creates within a four foot elevation difference of the top of the parapet of four feet or less, approximately between 42 inches and 48 is what we'd be looking for. And this will require that you file with us though. Um, this way we can look over the proposed landing area, ensure that it meets our requirements. And it also may need signage to indicate depending on how the um, platforms are distributed, we may need signage that shows where those are and that signage is only really done through an examination. Next slide, please. So any existing scaffolding will obviously have to be modified to provide access to the rooftop and a new scaffolding must be designed so that we can have landings on the rooftop. And like I said before, we may need signage on the exterior of the rooftop because landing areas or other critical locations on the rooftop may not be immediately visible upon, you know, from the ground level or even when the firefighter gets to the roof level. So we may require signage, but that's only during the plan examination portion that will uh, determine where those go. We don't want to overload the firefighters with information. We really want to keep it um, very clear and concise at the critical locations. And that will be determined by us alongside with our chiefs who have you know, a great deal of operational knowledge and know what the firefighters really need to see up there. Next slide. So in the idea of going green, we know that along with solar, there may be other technologies going up and that can include you know, wind turbines. So we are attempting to address that now. Um, <clears throat> so any equipment with exposed moving parts such as wind turbines or any you know, similar comparable equipment um, will have some additional requirements for clearances to protect the firefighters or anyone operating on the rooftop. And those would be no part of the equipment may obstruct any of the required clearances. That includes the perimeter access landings, the clear paths, and all the other clearances we'll be going over a little later. Um, <clears throat> that means so the base, none of the support structure may enter those areas. The moving parts themselves on those devices um, must be three feet away from any of the um, clearance areas. So as you can see in the diagram, the fan blade, the tips of the blades are three feet away from the required clearance area that happens to be six feet wide, nine feet high. It cannot be within three feet of that area. The tips or edges or ends of any of these moving parts must be marked, ideally with a reflective material and a material that's very clearly visible on whatever background it may be, say it's the sky or if there's another building beyond it, it'd be very visible. These things may be spinning at high speeds and as anybody knows, a fan blade or something spinning at high speed can become almost invisible as it spins, especially toward the edges. So we wanna be able to be sure that they can see the outline of it so that there is no accidents and no one accidentally walks into it. Finally, we're probably gonna require again, signage that will determine during a plan review uh, probably on the exterior to allow firefighters to know that there's something up there. And if it's a larger building with multiple of these in, um, in portions that are not clearly visible, 
you know, you say you have to turn a corner and it might be right there. We're going to also probably require additional signage on the rooftop to indicate where that stuff will be and to let them know that they need to be um, careful of it. Next slide, please. So we're on the rooftop now. You've landed. Great. Now you need to move around the rooftop. Um, so you're going to need your clear pass and they're going to be need to allow you to actually move. So the clear pass themselves are going to be six feet wide and nine feet tall. They're going to have to traverse from front to rear and side to side of the rooftop. You're going to need a distinct clear path for every hundred linear feet of the rooftop. And there can be no more than a hundred feet between any two distinct clear paths. The clear path shall connect to all required clearance areas and the rooftop energy storage systems. As we know, there are people are going to start putting these on the rooftops or want to put them on the rooftop. And it is critical that we have access to them in case there is a fire emergency on them. We want to have adequate access to those so that you know the firefighters can address it. You know, this is a new emerging technology and it is affecting the operations. We also want the clear path to be provide access to any window areas along the sides of the building that are not accessible to fire apparatus exposure. The front to rear side to side generally will handle most issues for uh, a regular square or rectangular building. But when we get into the buildings that are like H types or more regular shapes with multiple sides and beyond just four, we may need additional clear paths so that we can get to those areas again, so they can see if people are hanging out windows, see if there's smoke coming out the windows, see if there's fire coming out the windows, and be able to transmit that information to the incident commander. Solar panels and glass and or other transparent materials may not be used as part of the clear path. We've been told in the past, well, they're walkable, they're rated for walking, so on and so forth. But the firefighter, when they get up there, can't know that. Even if you put signs, they can't be 100% sure. They need to err on the side of caution. They can't risk falling through a skylight or stepping on a solar panel and breaking. They're there to move as quickly as possible, as safely as they can, in that situation and you know save lives and transmit information and stepping on an unsure a surface they're unsure about is not something they're going to want to do so those surfaces are not allowed to be part of the clear path you can have fences again crossing the clear path but again they must have gates to provide a path through those fences and those gates must be three feet wide and can be secured but must be cuttable by a standard bolt cutter and we also again knew to the code for this emerging technology is rooftop energy storage systems shall be designed in accordance with FC uh, 608. And the deflagration zones or exhausts from these systems may not overlap the clear path or any other required, other required clearances. Our concern is, you know, these things we know they're designed to relatively, if there is an emergency or an issue with them, you know, release the gases in a relatively safe way, but we want to ensure that that deflagration zone or any explosions or anything are far away from enough the um, required clearance areas that the firefighters aren't put at unnecessary risk and maybe possibly any of the occupants that may have retreated onto the rooftop or anyone who's working on the rooftop isn't put in any sort of unnecessary risk. Next slide, please. So you may have, like I said in the beginning, rooftops with multiple levels. You're going to need clear paths between those levels if possible, you know, because the firefighter may land on a lower rooftop and need to get to the upper rooftop that wasn't necessarily accessible via the, the ladder, the uh, fire apparatus ladder. So for these situations, we're going to need um, approved ladders or other approved means to gain access to that upper level. Um, and these really are only for um, elevation differences of 16 feet or less, anything more requires a cage be put around the ladder. And realistically, we can't use ladders that are caged because the firefighters have a lot of equipment on their back. I'm sure you've seen pictures of firefighters with these large tanks. They may have hooks for breaking windows or opening hatches or opening skylights. So they have a lot of equipment on them and those cages that are required by OSHA after a 16 foot high ladder would get all tangled up with their equipment. So anything over 16 feet, we don't require a ladder because of the cage. Ladders must be set a minimum of three feet away from the edge of anything, any um, large um, elevation difference. This way, if forbid that somebody slips, falls, you're not going to just fall straight off the edge of a roof and plummet two stories. There's a good chance maybe they'll hit the lower roof below, which is only 10 or 15 feet below them. It still may hurt them, but you know they'll probably hopefully survive the fall. And again, the exception for this is anything less than six feet. So if the upper roof is say a sm very small bulkhead that's less than six feet wide or six feet um, deep, 
it would, there's no real operations going to happen on there. So you don't require a ladder onto something like a very, very tiny bulkhead. Next slide, please. So like I brought up before, the um, regular shape buildings like H type buildings are going to need some additional clear paths because we want to be able to see everything that's going on on those edges. And um, so we're going to need um, each building will need its own clear path from um, each wing of the building, sorry, will need its own clear path from front to rear and side to side. Each wing is to be considered separately when calculating the required permit access. So each wing, you will have to do the permit access requirements for each wing because they are separated. All clear wings, uh, all paths for the, clear, the wings must be connected to each other. There must be a clear path that goes across the throat of the building, as you can see the center of the building where the bulkhead is. And even at the throat of the building, we need a front to rear and side to side as there as well. Uh, next slide, please. So you have your clear path and that's great, but on some rooftops, there will be open shafts, there will be large elevation differences and along those elevation differences, along those shafts, if the clear path is running along them, we're gonna need some fall protection. You know, it could be low light conditions. It could be very smoky up there. The firefighters or anyone else on that rooftop may not see that. And we don't want people falling to there to be injured or on, you know, forbid death because they couldn't see this, this elevation difference and just happened to walk off. So we'll probably require, we will require a 42 inch high barrier. It must be um, of significant construction and it must be securely fixed to the rooftop. And it must be along any elevation differences that are greater than six feet. Next slide. So you have your clear path, like we said, and that clear path has to go somewhere other than just the perimeter access landing areas. It needs to go to the other critical locations on the rooftop. These include fire escapes, hatches, skylights, uh, bulkhead doors, and those areas will need clearances of their own. So for say fire escapes you're gonna, or other rooftop accessible ladders, you're going to need three foot of clearance radius on each side. You can see it in the red over there to the left, um, three feet on each side of the ladder, and that's the radius, and then the center is obviously filled in, and that's the clearance that needs to be around the fire escape or other ladders. For rooftop accessible doors, you're gonna take from the, the hinge, you can see in the purple to the left, you're gonna create a six foot radius around the door, and that's your clearance around the door. For hatches and skylights, it'll be three feet on three sides. You can see in both the yellow, that is three feet on three sides of the hatches, skylights, and scuttles. Next slide, please. Now, there is a uh, interpretation of the code that we put out. It's been out there for a while, and some of you may have already heard it before. But for rooftops constructed um, in, in accordance with plans approved by DOB or FDNY before December 30th, 1st, <clears throat> 2017, skulls and skylights that do not have three to feet of clearance on three sides will be considered to be in compliance with FC 504.4 when that clearance is limited by the parapet wall or other qualifying encroachments. Very specific encroachment uh, things can be considered qualifying encroachments. These consider are uh, these are attic ventilators, chimneys, plumbing ventilation pipes, bulkheads, hatches, other scuttles, other skylights, and freestanding HVAC condensers with capacity of more than five tons. So you can see in the diagram those two skylights and the hatch all are the hatch is, uh, has a parapet within three feet of it, too close, but since it's a parapet, it's a qualifying encroachment, it's still considered compliant. The skylights are next to each other, obstructing their three foot wide clear paths, but their skylights, their qualifying encroachments, they're allowed to, it's still considered compliant. That doesn't necessarily mean the entire rooftop is compliant. If there are any other non-compliance on the rooftop, it still triggers the, requ the requirement for you to either file or bring the rooftop into compliance. Next slide, please. This is just the full um, language. If you were like the CUNY said, they're gonna be distributing these presentations. So we wanted to give you the full language so for your reference. Next slide. So you're gonna have all this equipment on your rooftops. There's gonna be conduits, pipes and cable trays on these rooftops, and they're gonna be need to be labeled uh, properly in accordance with the code. Um, these can be considered to be obstructions to the clear paths or any clear paths they cross. And that's only if the um, are greater than they're greater than 12 inches in height or 24 inches in width. And it needs to also be understood that it's not just the individual ones you got to think about. You also have to think them 
that if they're placed close together, they can be considered one large obstruction. So like you can see in the picture, there's three of them together. Each one of those may be less than a foot wide and uh, 24 inches high, but they're so close together, there's no way for the firefighter to step in between them. So they create like a four or five foot wide obstruction, which means that you would need, that would obstruct the whole area. So you can't really step over it without having to step on them. And that's not ideal. In the cases where there is an obstruction to the clear path caused by these, you will need to provide a non-combustible crossover, you know, just a little step over or something made of non-combustible material that will allow them to step over these areas and provide them a clear path over them. Next slide, please. I'm gonna breeze through the telecommunications section a little bit um, because you guys are obviously a little more focused on the, on the solar aspects and sustainable technologies. But just really quickly, all antennas on the rooftop must be properly labeled. And if they're concealed behind any stealth walls or um, screening, we will need to have them signage on that to allow anyone operating the rooftop, including the firefighters, knowledge that not to walk in front of these um, antennas. And obviously, signage must be installed per the code to allow anybody accessing from any access points, such as roofs, hatches, that there is telecommunications equipment on the rooftop. Next slide. Uh, new to the 2022 code, we are codifying our concerns about um, the radio frequency emissions. And just really quickly, any radio frequency emissions that exceed FCC exposure limits for general population will be considered to cause obstructions to any required clearance areas affected, including but not limited to the permanent access landing, rooftop hatches, skylight, clear paths, fire escapes, and rooftop accessible doors. The FDNY will require, may require additional documentation certifying these areas meet FCC guidelines when you file with us and must uh, these certifications must be done by a professional qualified to assess the exposure levels of in relation to the FCC guidelines. Next slide, please. We're also bringing, you know, with the new code, we want to codify a little bit about cantilevered buildings because we know this is going to be an emerging thing. It's going to start to grow the use of it because obviously space is a premium and people are starting to do this. So all of cantilever buildings shall be constructed in a way that adequately facilitates the firefighter operations. To do this, the cantilevered section of the building must be a minimum of 12 feet above the lower rooftop. Also, there must be nine feet of clearance between the cantilevered section of the rooftop and any building features below on the lower rooftop. That includes the parapet, the, the bulkheads, and so on and so forth. So as you can see in the um, diagram to the right, that reddish area, that would be your clearance under the cantilevered section that none of the building features from the building below may be in. So you have to design so that none of those building features enter that red area. Uh, you also be required to submit a fire analysis to the fire department for review. This is not part of the rooftop application, it is a separate application that you will need to fire, file. Next um, slide, please. Again, there for cantilever, there may be um, some zoning rules that require that you put a screen or some other <clears throat> screen walls or some other similar structure to meet zoning requirements. There's certain you know zoning requirements for the way a building looks. That's only when it's absolutely necessary, and they can be no more than eight feet wide, and they can be no more than twelve feet deep. Next slide. Along with going, you know, renewables, I know that we're also going to be pushing for having rooftop gardens and green roofs on rooftops. And so there are going to be some restrictions on those as well. Um, the foliage, the plants may not cause an obstruction to any of the required clearance areas, rooftop perimeter access areas, uh, clear paths. And any vegetation that exceeds 12 inches in height, similar to the way cable trays and conduits can if they exceed 12 inches in height are considered to be obstructions to the clear paths or any other clearance area <clears throat> that they are in. So in the picture to the right, you can see a bunch of plants, even one dried out plant to the right, that kind of obstructs the permit access landing area, especially if that dried out plant happens to catch fire and now you have a flaming wall and now how's the firefighter supposed to get past that? Also to the lower picture, you can see foliage all over. There's no real clear path there that's all more than 12 inches, how are they really gonna get around it? Also, 
when there is more than 250 square feet covered in uh, green roof or gardens, you're going to be required to provide an approved water supply. This isn't for firefighting operations. It's just to ensure that the rooftop is properly maintained. These are properly these gardens are properly maintained. Like I said, we don't want to dried out plants all over the rooftop. That creates kind of a tinderbox, and then the whole rooftop will be on fire, and that's really not a good time. Uh, next slide, please. The other important thing, especially I know with a lot of the solar industry is um, you guys will sometimes have to use ballast mounts and other things to hold down the panel because you can't penetrate the actual rooftop itself, um, <clears throat> the membrane on the rooftop. So any rooftop installation may not obstruct or interfere with the normal functions, maintenance, or access to any of the uh, critical rooftop features. That means we don't want vents obstructed from proper functionality and um, being maintained from maintenance staff. We also want all drains to be properly maintained and be accessible so that they can be cleaned. This is because, um, look, there, there can be water loads added to these things. And during a fire emergency, if they're on the rooftop performing any hose operations, especially now that we may be placing um, yes, um, energy storage systems on these rooftops, they may be pulling a hose line up to these rooftops and be pouring tons of water to put out the fire. And if these drains are not properly maintained, you will have a large buildup of water over the hours they're fighting the fire. And if the structure has been compromised in any way, or it's just not built to handle so much water, you know, you may have a roof collapse, which is a really terrible time. Next slide, please. And the final portion of 504.4 just says that rooftop solar installations shall be designed, installed, and operated in accordance with FC 512. We're going to be going into that shortly, but before that, we're going to go into FC 504.5. Next slide, please. So FC 504.5, this is new, deals with rooftop access on rooftops over 100 feet in height. This is very new. We never used to do this. And yes, we're doing over 100 feet. Next slide. So like I said, FC 504.4 deals with rooftops that are under 100, 100 feet or under in height. And FC 504.5 deals with rooftops that are over 100 feet in height. Rooftops that are over 100 feet in height must also comply with clear path requirements found in FC 504.4.4. Specifically, they must provide clear paths that are six feet wide. The paths must connect to any side of the rooftop which has windows, I mean, sorry, any side of the building that has windows. It must connect to all required clearance areas and critical locations, which include bulkhead doors, hatches, ladders, or any other points of access onto that rooftop. And the clearances around the bulkheads, doors, hatches, ladders must comply with the requirements found in FC 504.4.4 and FC 504.4.6, essentially what was found, the clearances that we detailed earlier in 504.4. Next slide. So now we're done with that. We're moving into your favorite section, solar, uh, FC 512. Next slide. So solar panels on rooftop, flat rooftops shall comply with the requirements of FC 504.4. Essentially everything we went over, you need to provide. There are exceptions for some of the clear paths for solar installations. One such is hinged mechanisms. Tech, if you can provide a hinge mechanism that creates a clear path through your solar panels in one motion when the firefighter lands, it technically can obstruct it until that hinge act is activated, but that will need a certificate of approval filed via TM2 app. To date, we've had this exception for about eight or nine plus years. And to date, we've never received a hinge mechanism that could do this and we've never granted an approval. So it's not as viable an option as just providing us the clearances required. We also allow for acceptable encroachments on narrow buildings that are 25 feet or less. Um, next slide. So to go into that and clarify a bit more, the code now, this used to be a, F, uh, a guide answer, but now we've put it brought into the code and that allows for qualifying encroachments to encroach on clear path to a limited extent under very specific circumstances. <clears throat> Those being the building rooftop must be 25 feet or less in width and or depth. The design of the solar panel installation must necessitate substantial coverage of that rooftop. The encroachment does not reduce the clear paths width beyond our approved amount and our minimal clear path 
must be a minimum of four feet in that scenario. Qualifying encroachments may not limit any other access landing areas or other required clearances unless otherwise permitted under a separate section or other guidelines. The proposed installation must be filed with DOB or and or the FDNY for review. You cannot professionally certify this. We want to have um, city plan examiners eyes on this to ensure that the reduction in the clear path is acceptable by the acceptable amount and that the encroachments on that clear path are qualifying. And the installation must obviously comply with all the fire code requirements and meet all the other requirements for clearances and so on and so forth. Next slide. So again, the qualifying encroachment similar to the previous um, example were attic ventilators, chimneys, plumbing ventilations, freestanding HVAC condensers over five tons, bulkheads, hatches, skulls, skylights. Solar panels are not considered to be a qualifying encroachment and they may not limit the clear path. The diagram to the next, you can see, say you have three skylights, you know, there, they can limit the clear path to four feet. That's fine. That would be considered um, still compliant based on this uh, code clarification, this code section. However, as you can see, the solar panels don't, and they must provide a six foot clear path. So this would be a code compliant scenario um, based on all the code. Next slide. Now, also, I'm sure you guys deal with a lot of rooftops that are not flat. You deal with pitched rooftops. So your pitched rooftop is a rooftop that has a pitch greater than 20 degrees. In such a scenario, you must provide three feet of clearance along both sides of the ridge line. As you can see in red in the diagram, three feet of each along each ridge line of the rooftop. Next slide. Any conduits, wiring systems, raceways must be located along the dips and valleys from away from the ridge line, and they must all be uh, properly labeled as per the requirements of the code. Next slide. <clears throat> we do have a, a, we did add this, this was again in a previous allowance that we had given, but we actually brought into the code. Um, <clears throat> for group R3 occupancies, whose rooftop slope is 9.5 degrees or greater, they do not have to co uh, comply with FC 504.4 requirements. However, these rooftops instead will be considered to be uh, s sloped rooftops or peaked rooftops, and they would have to comply with FC 512. In this case, you would have to provide, a, like similar to the previous, three feet on either side of the ridge line on both sides of the ridge line. Now, <clears throat> if your rooftop just has a sloped feature, or some sloped elements that doesn't necessarily qualify for this, it has to be the actual rooftop, the majority of the rooftop or the whole rooftop itself that is sloped greater than 9.5 degrees. Next slide. So that's the basic overview of the code. I just wanted to get into now some common non-compliant installations, show you some examples, discuss quickly some solutions possibly and how to file. Next slide. So, when are you required to file an application? What requires one? When you have a non-compliance on the rooftop, anywhere on the rooftop, whether it's existing or proposed, and you're doing any of the following work, installing new equipment on the rooftop that includes cell sites, solar arrays, um, HVAC fencing, you're doing a vertical enlargement, adding penthouses, bulkheads, um, you're adding rooftop bars, green roofs, you're doing blue roofs, greenhouses, new construction, you're building a cantilever building over that rooftop. Those will all trigger the code if there's a non-compliance existing or proposed on that rooftop. Next slide. So what are some examples of non-compliance that we've seen out there in the wild? Um, you have to the top left, solar array completely obstructing the rooftop, no perimeter access, no clear paths. There's no way we can operate on this rooftop. That has to be corrected. To the right of that, you have a fence. It looks, you know, not too bad when you look at it, but that fence is tall. It's not laterable. The firefighters can't get down from it. It would have to either be set back, removed, or relocated in some way to allow for proper landing areas. To the right of that, we have a rooftop completely covered in telecommunications equipment and antennas, greatly limiting the perimeter access areas. That would, again, have to be corrected. Um, to the right of that, we could see a fire escape ladder that is not only obstructed by the clearances around it, obstructed by an equipment platform and the chains that go in front of it, 
But also this one happened to have been cut and welded. We do not allow you to cut and weld unless you have gotten prior permission to it. You cannot weld them because to the your equipment platform without prior permission because we cannot be sure that um, these are safe still, that these were done properly. And we don't want firefighters or the public climbing onto these and these things breaking and someone falling and being injured. We also don't want chains in front of the fire escape or any other obstructions because we don't want someone playing with a chain or trying to open a chain while standing on top of fire escape in a fire emergency. And then while they're playing with it, trying to open it up, happening to fall. To the bottom two, you can see solar panels, one flush mounted, one very close to the rooftop level. Uh, height. They look like very clear rooftops, but like I said before, firefighters will not walk on these. We cannot tell if they are safe to walk on, and we don't. They don't have time or the luxury to figure it out or look for signage always. So these would be considered obstructions to the doors. Uh, for the picture to the right, you can see the bulkhead door. There's no way to really get there because the those flush-mounted solar panels are everywhere, obstructing the clear path. And to the left, you see the skylights. They're completely surrounded by the panels. There's no way for anyone to get there. Finally, obstructions don't have to be something that's permanent. They can be something like rubbish, or in this case, the right, a bunch of plastic bottles that are meant to eventually be recycled being piled 10 or 12 feet high, 10 or 12 feet deep on a rooftop. There's no way to access this rooftop. You can't really do this. And this you know, had to obviously be corrected. Next slide, please. One of my favorite personal favorites, and one of the reasons when people ask, why do we need to file? Why do we need to go through these processes? Why do you need to see all this information? This is a perfect example. While most people and most of you will obviously do an excellent job and you know build things to safely, there are instances where people you do ridiculous things like this. So we need to see it. This, this equipment platform literally had a staircase that went off and the final step was right off the side of the rooftop. Um, you can see back there, it was about a three or four story building. And it just, if you, it was low light condition, you didn't see that nothing was beyond that. You would take that final step and it would be your final step. Um, next slide, please. So what does not require an application? Obviously, if your rooftop's fully compliant with all the requirements of the code, you don't need to file with us. You don't need to come with us, come to us. You are good to go. You can install as long as your rooftop is code compliant and will be code compliant, the entire rooftop. Also, ordinary repair, even if an ordinary repair on a rooftop or maintenance of rooftops, such as re-roofing, parapet repair, facade repair, and like-for-like -like replacement equipment, do not require a variance to be filed if your rooftop's in non-compliance. And when we say like-for-like -like replacement, we're talking about exact same part numbers. So if you have, say there was an antenna and the part number for that antenna is one, two, three, four, five, and you go to replace it with one, two, three, four, five, A, that triggers the requirement to file because it is technically a different component, it is not exactly a like for like replacement, even though it may look the same, it may be the same size, it may do very similar functions. It isn't technically considered an upgrade or, or equipment change and that would trigger the code. Next. Next slide, please. So now you know when to file. Now you need to know how to file. So to file, you're going to go through now our FDNY business portal. Um, at this, I've given you the um, link for it. Once you get to the business portal, you're going to go click to the business tab. And once you click there, you can click the user guide. If you're a brand new user, you've never used it. The user guide will help walk you through the process of using the system. Um, and then you're going to create an account, or if you're a returning user, you can just log in. When you're when you're um, submitting your application, it is important that you submit and follow the correct path for submitting. So for a rooftop installations and variance requests, you're going to be selecting design and installation, technology management application, and finally you're going to select rooftop variance. Do not select fire code variance. It will not come to the rooftop unit, even if it does make it to us eventually. We will have to issue a, de a denial to it, kick it back to you, and have you file a whole new application. And your application, when you refile it for rooftop variance under the correct thing, will end up at the back of the queue, meaning it will take you longer to get your application reviewed. And I know, you know, time is of the essence for everybody. So it is important that you submit under the proper variance application. Make sure you select rooftop variance. Next, uh, next slide, please. 
So what are you going to need to, when you file, you're going to need to provide an application fee of 420. There are no resubmission fees. We understand this is a variance process. There's going to be back and forth, and we do not want to penalize you for that back and forth. So as of right now, you pay the initial fee of 420. And when you resubmit, as long as you resubmit within six months of the deficiency letter that we issue, there will be no additional payment required. Um, the documents you'll have to submit with it are a TM5 application. You can also have to submit a, an 11 by 17 format, plans with original signatures and seals from your professional engineer or RA. You're gonna to need to provide us with a narrative for the scope of work. You're gonna to need to give us photographs of the current conditions. Be sure you do give us good photos with, um, all, with plans that show where those photos were taken from. The better we understand your rooftop, the less likely we are to issue deficiencies asking for more information. Don't overload us, don't give us 200 pages of photos, but make sure we can clearly tell what's on the rooftop in every location of the rooftop. The clearer picture we have of your rooftop, the more likely we are to ask less questions and have misunder less misunderstandings about what's really going on with your rooftop and the more likely you can move through the variance process quickly. All other relevant documentation from other city agencies and other, maybe the FDNY itself, such as summonses, should be also brought to our attention because if we catch them during our review and we find them, we're going to have more questions. Be upfront with us with what's going on so you can have an easier time through our process. And as always, all documents submitted to us must be in PDF format. Next uh, slide, please. This is just showing you what the TM5 looks like. Be sure you have original uh, owner signature and the original um, applicant signature on this. Next slide. This is just an idea of what we kind of expect a plan to look like. So again, it should be an 11 by 17 format. The entire rooftop should be shown, not just where you're doing work. We want to see the entire rooftop. We can, when we review these, we review the rooftop holistically because we're reviewing it for the operations, not just your work, but how the rooftop itself and is, the conditions on it, and how those will affect the firefighters' operations. You need to label all existing building features, all areas of non-compliance. You're going to label all your proposed work, all existing work. Label them as proposed and existing. Do not use other words like new or anything like that. Proposed and existing. That gives us a clear understanding of what is was already there and what you're proposing to do. Label the apparatus accessible exposures. Give us the street names. Give us, tell if it's a parking lot. So you can see in the example, there's Example Street and John Avenue. Make sure you have those there so we can properly orient ourselves when we're doing our, our examination. Again, show where you're, you're non-compliant, show where you are compliant. And if there is a non-compliance and you're proposing some sort of mitigation to you know, mitigate the effects of that non-compliance, make sure you show and call out that mitigation. All plans must have an original PE or RA stamp. And we are asking that you um, <clears throat> provide a one, one and a half by three and a half clear box on the plans for the FDNY approval stamps. Um, um, so that we don't have to stamp over any of your portions of your plan or anything you wrote. You know, sometimes that makes the stamp illegible. It makes some of what you wrote illegible. So it's, it's good to just provide us with a small area like that. It doesn't have to be like in the location that I put on the example. It can be anywhere. Just make sure we have a nice clear box to, that we can tell is defined for that. Next slide, please. And these are just some additional resources. Unfortunately, some of them are a little dated, again, because we're in a transition period from the 2014 code to the 2022 code. However, both the guide and the bulletin still are useful source of sources of information, as a lot of what is in the 2014 code directly has been moved into the 2022 code. So it's always good to reference them. And you can also reference the fire code itself, especially the 2022 that is up already it's not the full release it's the marked up release but you can still access it now and that talks about fc 504.4 fc 504.5 and fc 512 next finally if you have any questions concerns that you want to direct toward us the best way to go about it is to go through fdy business support at this you can email them at this um fdy business support fdy um when you do that it'll generate a ticket with a ticket number that will be given to you and this way, they'll route the question eventually to us, 
and we will try to get back to you as soon as possible. But if something happens and it gets lost in the shuffle, you will have a ticket number that you can go back to business support and be like, hey, I submitted a question under such and such ticket number. Can you look into what happened to it? I need, I really need an answer. And then they can pull up what that question was, pull up what they did with it and recontact us to get that answer to you. And next slide. I know that was a very long presentation. I really appreciate your attention on it. There was a lot to go over and I guess we have some time for questions. I don't know if we're doing those today, but thank you again for your attention. Yes, we do have some time for questions if, uh, if Yash can come back on with us as well as you, John. And uh, you know, thank uh, you very much for that very informative uh, presentation. And again, we'll have these slides up because there's a lot to go over on the slide. So we'll go quickly through some questions. Well, you don't have to be too quick. It looks like we have about, um, about 20 minutes here. And Yash, uh, I will start with a clarify question to you regarding um, if the, the TM2 is indeed the same as the COA. We had a couple of people asking about clarification for that. Um, Yash, can you unmute yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, the TM2 application is to receive a certificate of approval. Excellent. Okay. So, John, over to you. The question is, do existing roofs constructed before the enactment date of the code revisions need to be brought into compliance when any rooftop alteration occurs? So, yes and no. The answer is, Yes, technically they would have to be brought into full compliance when you do an alteration that triggers the code to bring it into full compliance. However, that's the reason for the existence of my unit is to provide you with the option to get a variance from our unit. So no, you technically don't have to bring it into full compliance. You can file for a variance with my unit and obviously understanding that there are hardships with bringing a rooftop into full compliance. You know, we will try and work with you to bring it into condition that facilitates firefighter operations while still allowing you to install your equipment on a non-compliant rooftop. All right, thank you very much. I hope that answered the question. Uh, back over to Yash. Can you clarify which battery systems can be inside, especially with regards to whether R3 is allowed? For that, it would depend on the technology and that is defined in the certificate of approval. <clears throat> so when we review the, the system, and see the test results, we will make a determination on which locations uh, that system would be accept acceptable to be installed in. Um, any examples? What, what was that? What do you mean by examples? Of the technology? Uh, like that, lithium. Yeah. Lithium ion, uh, lead acid, uh, this uh, valve drug. Valve regulated lead acid batteries, uh, nickel cadmium, and I think full batteries also. All right, thank you. Um, John, if there is a fence running along the perimeter of the roof that is set back six feet from the parapet, does there need to be an additional six foot clear path inside that fence? Uh, I mean, you would still need the six foot clear path to run from front to rear side to side. Um, you, that is, I mean, that's a very particular odd situation. And you can obviously always reach out to the rooftop unit for your particular situation, but you just have to provide your clear path from front to rear side to side, however that's provided. And you would just have to provide a clear path through the fence. If it's set foot back six feet, you would provide the landing area, which is acceptable. Um, the only problem is if you are traversing along an unprotected area along the perimeter, along that fence, you would also need a protective barrier because it is technically an elevation difference. So it's a comp it's a little bit of a complicated nuanced situation there. Um, if I can get an example, you know, a more concrete example in the future, if they want to provide you with one, I would be happy to answer it a little bit fuller um, down the road. Okay. 
Um, perhaps uh, whoever put that question in can put it in with the nuances and we'll make sure it gets to you in writing. Um, Yash, we have a question that we're, we're doing a little bit of um, working on it to make sure that we're asking what, their, what they, their intent might be. The question was, what is the permit um, COA if it is unmanned and not really a building? So we're interpreting that to, to be that essentially they are asking what's the difference between a TM-2 versus a TM-1 permit? Yash, you're on mute. Sorry, my bad. I keep on forgetting. Uh, so for a TM1 is basically for the installation approval of the battery energy storage system. So it's getting permission to install the system in a specific location. Whereas the TM2 application is for the approval of the system itself, not the location. So once the, the equipment is approved, you can use that equipment in any location throughout NYC or New York City. Okay, I hope, I hope that helps. Um, John, for the landing area, are exhaust permitted, uh, are exhaust permitted obstructions? And what are the limits of the exhaust within the landing area as shown on the slides from the FDNY? Um, so I know the pictures may have shown exhaust there. Those are just pictures. Unfortunately, that's not saying those are all not causing obstruction. I was just noting where the landing area would be calculated. Um, exhaust pipes, vent pipes, anything in the landing area is really considered to cause an obstruction because you have to understand the firefighter is attempting to jump down from a ladder onto that. And, you know, you don't want to jump down onto a, a, a vent vertically in the air. That's going to hurt. Um, so they would be considered an obstruction um, to the landing area, not a large obstruction, obviously, but it would cut off part of that area and you know you would need to calculate accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yash, um, back on audio for you. For energy storage system applications, is the emergency response plan optional? One of the slides said something about being optional, so we, we want to clarify that. Uh, that is for the TM2 application. Uh, and sometimes some manufacturers would have a plan that's already ready and established for their technology. And uh, in some technologies, they might not have that plan. So that's why it's listed as optional. Gotcha. OK. John, if a structure were to be installed on the roof, presumably a canopy structure, and the clearance from the roof was nine feet, but not at the parapet. Would a six foot offset for any vertical installation suffice for a nine foot clearing height? So I'm assuming they're talking about the canopy, they're concerned about how we, the perimeter access landing area, nine foot height. So yeah, you'd have to set it back six feet so that there'd be clearance for nine feet. Once they're on the rooftop and on the actual rooftop, you just need a rooftop clearance from the parapet um, once you're into the clear path, you just need nine feet of clearance from the clear path. It doesn't have to be for the clear path nine feet above the parapet um, because they'd be traversing along the rooftop and they just need nine feet of head clearance. The height nine feet above the parapet is only when they're coming onto the rooftop in the permanent access landing area. Again, because you're basically talking about walking through a small portal, you know, like if your awning was right above at the permanent access landing area. If your awning is only nine feet above the rooftop, but your say parapet's four feet, the actual place the firefighter would have to squeeze through would be about five feet, which is much smaller. So if you set it back six feet, it can just be nine feet above the rooftop. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and Yash, is there a list of um, BSS systems that have a COA? Uh, currently, I'm only... Uh... Currently, we don't have a list yet, and we're working on establishing the list as more uh, manufacturers apply and receive their COA. But currently, we don't. Okay. It, do you have any kind of time frame for that? Uh, no, currently, we don't. Okay. Thank you. Um, John, are there any specific codes 
or determinations applicable to solar canopies or solar awnings that are specific? No, there are no specifics. It's just the general clearances required for the, you know, the clear path and six foot wide, nine foot high, same for all the other clearance areas. You know, you just need the nine foot head clearance and whatever the clearance is listed in the code are. Um, nothing specific to those. Okay, thank you. Um, Yasha, follow up question here. Um, again, uh, the, uh, the attendee just wants to clarify. So currently all lithium ion is not allowed inside? Uh, that is not correct. Uh, in the new fire code 2022, lithium ion is allowed to be installed inside but uh, the installation requirements and uh, the installation locations that the BSS will be allowed to be installed in would be defined in the certificate of approval. So in that certificate of approval, it will list which locations that specific system using lithium ion technology would be able to be installed in. Okay, very uh, individualized there. Um, John, for solar installations, are there any FDNY permits required to be pulled by the electrician? Is the general contractor owner of the project responsible for other FDNY required approvals or permits? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that particular question. They would really, I'm only really focused on the actual access onto the rooftop and this, you know, the clearances and safety for that. Um, we can get back to them on that. If you send us that as one of your questions, we will look into that and send them a sufficient answer. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Yash, um, what are the typical turnaround times? I don't know if there's anything typical for TM2 approvals. Uh, that varies depending on application to application because sometimes some manufacturers have gone through different processes of testing and can provide different pieces of information. So sometimes it's not a complete application. So there's a bit of back and forth between us and the manufacturer, which extends the review process and the time frame. So we can't give like a definitive timeline you're relying on other people responding in a timely fashion, it sounds like. Um, John, why do skylights require four feet, but solar must have six feet clear path? So this, again, realistically, we want what the code generally requires, which is the six feet, but it was an understanding that on these smaller rooftops to better facilitate the installation, you know, allow solar industry to install on these smaller rooftops, there's no way for you really to remove a skylight from a building. There's no way for you to remove a scuttle hatch. That would be a fairly ridiculous ask from us. So in the understanding of that, we have allowed those small, you know, obstructions to obstruct portions of it. Also understanding that it's only for a short period of time. Usually, you know, a, a skylight's normally three, four feet max. So only about four or five feet would be reduced to the four feet. Whereas the solar installation, you're going to obviously want to cover as much of the rooftop as possible, which would mean that the whole rooftop would only have a four foot clear path, which is really not the ideal size of a clear path, which is why it's only the structures that can't really be moved and can't really be changed without significant hardship to the owner. Gotcha. Another clarification question to John. Uh, in the new code, does the clear path providing access to window areas on the side of the buildings below 100 feet only apply to building constructed after the effective date of this section. And I can repeat that if you want me to. No, so the code section, that code section is more of a clarification. We've always asked for things like on H type buildings or regular shape buildings to give us additional clear paths for that very reason. Um, it's just a more of a clarification that we want to have, you know, a clear path accessing all those sides so that they can look over and see, again, the um, the windows and such. So, you know, when you trigger the code, when you do work on the rooftop, you would have to give us those additional clear paths to comply with the code. 
Um, it doesn't have to necessarily, I know this is also a question that may come up, it doesn't have to run along those sides. We don't expect a, a full clear path all along that side. We just need access to that side. A six foot clear path just reaching that wall so we can, FIFI essentially can reach over, look around, and then transmit that information to the incident commander. Okay, I think you, you just answered part two of that question, but let me just read it out here. Is that clear path required to provide access along the entire side of the building with windows or just the portion of the perimeter directly above the windows? Um, it doesn't even have to technically directly above. It just has to provide access to that side. And um, ideally it's above the windows so that it facilitates the you know something like a rooftop rope rescue operation. That's the ideal, but the code's really just asking for access to it so they can potentially do the rescue and also more than anything else, be able to provide the information by looking over and gathering information for the incident commander. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for one more question here. And uh, there are a number of more questions that are, are a bit more individualized and nuanced that would, um, we'll send to you in writing. So the final question here for you, John, um, can you elaborate on the new requirements of FC 504.4.1, and then there's a parenthesis seven, <laughs> and how it applies to parapets or other perimeter railings? Um, and then there's more specifics in writing, but if you, if you have, have uh, just a minute or two to elaborate on that. Um, so, I mean, what we were trying to do really with this is, clarify something that's always been an issue in the industry for us, trying to describe what was considered to be a obstruction and what was not. We're really only concerned for this, it's really only for the perimeter access. It's not so much for the, um, that particular section isn't really discussing the barriers around the entire rooftop. It's really just focusing in on what would obstruct, what sort of barrier or per, uh, parapet would obstruct uh, the fire apparatus accessible exposures. Um, so that's really what it is. And the to go into more detail of why we're talking about for the newly constructed one, we don't want to expect everyone to um, change their parapets today, run out and change them all. But as you're installing them, we want them to be built in such a way that properly facilitates the operations, which is why we're saying they should be substantial and support 350 pounds of point load, because the firefighter may have to, as they're dismounting the ladder, step onto the parapet. And they have a lot of gear. They're big guys, and they have a lot of gear on their backs. So, you know, we want to be able to support them and not break or something. You know, we want the surface to be level when they're newly constructed because, again, they might have to step down onto it or step up onto it while dismounting or getting back onto the ladder. So we want a level surface. And the five inches was to allow a proper footing. So it's, again, not for the entire rooftop. It's mainly really focusing on allowing the fire, fire to get back on the ladder or dismount from the ladder onto the rooftop. It's really focused in on the perimeter access area. And again, the further clarification about if it's, you know, greater than four feet in height, needing some sort of landing area or um, landing platform was to, you know, clarify that, hey, we understand that there are going to be parapets out there that are much taller, that do not work right now when you when you're designing but we do have alternatives we do have ways to get around it and if you provide us a platform that raises it high enough we can work with you so that's really what the code is trying to do it's always kind of been part of the process for years when you filed for a variance with us we would basically tell you these things but we wanted to we'd always get questions what is going on here so we wanted to really clarify in the code and you know present it to everyone so everyone when they read the code knew what we were trying to get at Thank you very much. We're finishing up right on time for the morning, Yash and John. You, your help is uh, and your presentation has been uh, stellar. And again, there'll be uh, any questions not answered, we will send to, to you two in writing. There were a lot of great comments um, in the comment in the question and answer also of people thanking Yash and John for their help on on particular projects. So. Uh, moving forward and coming a long way to helping um, New York City safely accommodate solar and storage. We thank you. We're going to take a one hour lunch break. You can leave your Zoom open. We will see you back at 1 p.m. for presentations from the New York City Department of Buildings. 
as well as a panel discussion featuring representatives from the New York City Mayor's Office, from NYSERDA, New York Best, and NYSEA, and as well as more feedback opportunities for you. So please come back right at one o'clock. We're gonna start off with questions to our attendees. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We'll see you in one hour. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes, and we're going to start off with a question for our attendees. Welcome back everyone. Just gonna give another minute or two for everybody to come back to the Zoom screen. And we will have a question for you in just a moment.
Okay, can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, um, but you can go ahead and mute yourself. We're not quite ready. We're going to have a warm up question first. Thank you. I think he's on. All right, attendees, welcome back. We have a, another survey question for you. Once again, it, it, please look in the Q&A box. This is a different link than the first question, new link, new question. So please click on that new link. Now, we're gonna make you work a little bit on this one. This is a write-in question, no multiple choice. What do you want the city's leadership and policymakers to know about your industry? Now you go to the Q&A box, you click on the link for workshop questions two, and then you can answer that live. You don't need to put it in the Q&A box itself, just click on the link and then you can answer that. This is anonymous. Now, those of you who have been with the New York City Solar Roundtable since in inception, all right, that was just five of you back then when we started in 2009, but you know how much the industry has guided our work and informed the policymakers. So please share with us your informative first hand knowledge and don't forget to hit submit. We promise to pass it along. If you're just joining us, go to the Q&A box and click on that link for the question workshop question number two. I'll give you folks a minute to answer. And then we're going to go right into the New York City Department of Buildings presentation. In just one minute. All right, everybody, please come on back to your Zoom screen. We appreciate you taking the time to respond to question number two. It's really going to help inform our work going forward. Now we move into the New York City Department of Buildings presentation on construction and electrical permits and material acceptance application process. Up first is Barry Stein, the Chief Plan Examiner for the New York City Department of Buildings. Thank you, Barry, for joining us. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Great. Okay, hi, I'm Barry Stein. I'm the Chief Plan Examiner at the Helpful Service. And this uh, presentation was compiled by all of my uh, associates. Next slide. Okay. So we're going to discuss the uh, solar permitting process, and we're also going to give you some um, applications. We'll give you general requirements, all the different um, items that you need to file an application, then specifically what needs to be done for a property tax abatement. We'll talk about zoning, and then we're gonna give you some examples that we've come up with that are interesting. Next. Okay. So if you see, we started keeping records in 2011, and we had a total of 165 applications. This is for PTA and non-PTA projects. And uh, 10 years later, we're up to 6,012 applications. So we're really busy. Uh, so all solar jobs are still being filed as biz applications through e-filing, and they're reviewed through hub full service or hub self-service. So solar applications are not yet filed through DOB now. We don't have a date for that. Um, and it should be noted that as of 6-1-2020, if it's a non-tax abatement job, 
you no longer have the option to have it reviewed in the boroughs. Every solar job, whether it's a PTA or non-PTA, comes to our unit. Now, there's also an option to file a PTA or a non-PTA project through Hub Self Service, but if it's a, which means that it's professionally certified. But if it's a PTA application, it's limited to one or two family residents that have a sloped roof and do not exceed 10 kW. Okay, but these don't require these requirements don't apply for non-PTA applications. Next slide, please. Okay. So the solar um, abatement is 5% of the solar um, expenditures or the amount of taxes payable in such tax year up to $62,500. Um, another thing where we are now is that effective November 15th, 2019, we came out with local laws 92 and 94, and they're mandating that our new buildings and new roofs resulting from enlargements of existing buildings, and when you replace an existing roof deck, that you have to create a sustainable roofing zone. So 100% of which must be either a solar voltaic electrical generating system, a green roof system, or a combination thereof. So you can see the requirements under Buildings Bulletin 2019-10. Also something where we are now is we're beginning to talk about battery backup systems, tax abatement filing protocols, which my colleague Alan Price will talk a little bit more about after we're finished. Next slide, please. Okay. So recently, the zoning resolution was revised to include additional locations where you can put solar panels. For example, accessory power systems, including but not limited to generators, solar energy systems, fuel cells, batteries, and other energy storage systems are now permitted in required yards. This was not so the uh, last year. Um, the energy storage tax abatement is going to be written into the RCNY 105-02, which is in process. And at a future date, the applications will go into DOB now. Next slide, please. Okay. So these are the items that are required to get a construction project through. You'll need a construction permit, and that's required before the beginning of the installation, an electrical permit required before the installation. After the installation is done, you get a construction sign-off and an electrical sign-off. Both are done by the Department of Buildings. You also need to get Con Ed to come out and give you a Con Edison connection letter. And if there's any type of backup ba battery backup storage, you're going to need your OTCR approval. You get a conditional approval prior to the beginning of the installation, and you get a final approval after. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, filing requirements. So. Projects that are filing for the property tax abatement, you e-file them through Hub Full Service or through Hub Full Service, and that's a professional certification of objections. Or, as I said before, for one and two family homes with pitched roofs under 10 kW, you can have them professionally certified and you can file through Hub Self Service. Now, this is important. When you file, you have to make sure that your work type, if this is a tax abatement application, says OT solar tax. The thing is, is that if it doesn't say that and you want a tax abatement, we cannot modify that at any time afterwards. So um, please be careful to make sure that you say OT solar tax if it is a PTA project. 
Um, and if it's not a property tax abatement, you can also file through the e-filing hub full service or hub self service. And as previously stated, these are all now reviewed through our unit. Nothing gets reviewed through the borough. Also, B Buildings Bulletin 2018-008 means that the applicant also has to um, sign up for a final inspection. This is an in addition to the construction and electrical inspections that are done by the department. Next slide, please. Okay. Licensing requirements. So in terms of licensed professionals, you're going to need a New York State registered architect, RA, or a professional PE. And we just call that an acronym AOR, applicant of record. You will also have, unless the building was constructed after April 1st, 1987, you will need to submit a asbestos certification form and you'll need an asbestos, a certified asbestos investigator for that. And you will have some special inspections that are on the TR1 and you're going to need a registered special inspector or a special inspection agency. And it should be noted that the applicant of record may also be the special inspection agency. And um, applicant of records can perform progress inspections. They just can't perform special inspections unless they're a special inspection agency or a special inspector. Next plan, um, next slide, please. Okay. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna fill out your forms and upload all documents through e-filing. And then you pay online and then you submit it to Hub Full Service as professional certification of objections. And generally no meetings are required or hub self-service, which means that it's professionally certified with the limitations I described before, and you can get instant approval. But you should note that these jobs are subject to random or special audit. And then you can electronically submit your, w, your PW2 through e-filing, and then you can get your permit. Next slide, please. Okay. These are the various forms that you're going to need. You need an EF1, which is a cover sheet, the PW1, which is basically like a reader's digest of your, um, of your uh, summary of your project. It's going to include the project site, building characteristics, zoning information, applicant and owner information. You'll need a PW2 work permit. You'll need a PW3 cost estimate, okay? Application fees are based on the construction costs. PTA applications are limited only to work pertaining to this solar installation. You'll also need a TR1, and generally you'll only have two special inspections, structural stability and fire resistant penetration and joints. Um, you'll also have two progress inspections, energy code compliance and final. Depending on the project, you may have another special or progress inspection, but these are the four that we generally need. Next slide, please. You will need a TR-8, Technical Report Statement of Responsibility for Energy Code, and you'll have one progress inspection, which is the air sealing and insulation. So I wanna mention about the tenant protection plan. So you need this if the building is going to be occupied during construction. As of November, 2020, we use, the TPP is now a required item submitted prior to permit. 
and you have to submit it separately through DOB now. Previously, it was prior to approval and the plan examiners reviewed it. Uh, you're also going to need an ACP7, ACP21 if there's asbestos, or an ACP5 if it's not an asbestos project. And then, as I said before, the exemption is you don't need any asbestos forms if the building was approved on or after April 1st, 1987. And if you do end up with an ACP 721, you'll have to do all the abatement prior to the start of construction. Uh, PW2, the work permit, and an L2, that would be if you have any uh, violations, um, work without permits, and that has to all be cleared up before you would be able to get your construction approval. And that is also submitted through DOB now. Now, if it's uh, for specific jobs, for the pro property tax abatement, you have to have the PTA-4 form. And for approval, you just need a preliminary form at filing. In some cases, you may have to get a letter of acceptance from the fire department if your roof does not meet the fire code. And that's a TM5 application, and that was discussed earlier. And if it's a professionally certified application, you have to fill out a POC1 form. Next slide, please. Okay. Items required for specific jobs continued. An AOS1, that's a professional owner signature, and that's an online form for applications filed at Hub Full Service. PW1B plumbing riser diagram, that would only be required if you were doing a solar thermal application. And I think for all the years that we've been here, we've seen maybe one or two of these. You may be in a landmarks district or your building may be an individual landmark. In that case, you would either need to get a certificate of no effect for existing buildings or a certificate of appropriateness for new buildings. If you have a city owned building excluding NYCHA, you need approval from the Public Design Commission. And also you might need OTCR approval for buildings that incorporate electrical energy storage equipment. Next slide, please. Okay. The different various signatures that you're going to need is the owner, the PE, the RA, general contractor, the asbestos investigator, and the notary for the PW3. Next slide. Okay. These are the drawings that are required a plot plan, location of the building, and what we really look for there is we want to see the site characteristics and especially noting anything that might be a falling hazard. Then you need a site plan, roof plan, elevations. This is where you're going to show all the solar modules, the equipment and the structure pertinent to or having impact on code compliance of the system. And of course, very importantly, you want to show fire code compliance. You want to show your system components, location of main meter, the AC disconnect switch, the inverters. Also, we want to see zoning compliance. We want you to give us a diagram of the height and setback requirements for that zoning district and how your building fits within that. If you're in a special flood hazard area, you have to give us a firm, P firm, substantial improvement calculations, indicate the BFE, the DFE, and other flood lines on elevations. Next slide. You'll also want to give us an energy analysis. We want to see the anchorage and racking system. We want to see a structural and wind analysis statement. And we want to see 
the fire department access. One thing that I want to stress is that no electrical drawings are required for the architectural plan approval. The exception is that, and we'll talk about this in a later slide, that a separate filing may be required for electrical plan examination when the solar equipment is above 600 volts, the solar system is 1,000 kVA or above, or it is connected to the first, second level OCPD of an existing 1,000 kVA service. Next slide. Okay. Now, two separate paths. You have the construction, and then you have the electrical. So simultaneously. Um, then for the electrical permit, you file an ED-16, and you can get your work permit. And as I said before, there's no plans that have, are required except if your system is 600 volts or 1,000 kVA and above. In that case, you also may need a predetermination. At the end of the construction, you will get an electrical inspection from the DOB. And at that point, you will need a drawing. You'll need a three-line electrical line electrical diagram. And as I said, these items are pursued independently from the construction drawing approval. Next slide. Okay. So right now, New York City adopts the 2008 NEC, which is the 2011 New York City Energy Code. So a practical difficulty of complying with Article 690 is that the 2011 New York City Electrical Code isn't available for systems over 600 volts. So then an applicant would have to file a predetermination in order to use the 2014 NEC for solar installations. Um, for applicants that are for proposals 1,000 kVA or above, or for systems connected to a first or second level of an existing 1,000 kVA service, a filing for electrical plan examination is required. So if you need to file a CCD1, you would file it through the hub full service determinations and we forward it over to our technical affairs department and in conjunction with them, they review it with us. Next slide. Okay. To actually get a tax abatement, you have to submit the signed off application to the DOB by March 15th in order to get the abatement to commence July 1st of that year. This includes filing some items through e-submit and some items through DOB now. Items that are required after permit are as follows. So you might want to, if you have as built, you may need to file PAAs through e-filing. If you do, you can't notify the plan examiner directly. You have to notify hub full service project advocate at buildings.nyc.gov, and they in turn will let the plan examiner know that there's PAAs to review. After the work is completed, you're going to have to request both a construction inspection and an electrical inspection through DOB Now. You're also going to need to obtain the Con Edison utility letter. Also, you'll upload a final PW, a PW7, a final PTA4, a final PW3, an EN2, a final TR1, TR8, and a TR7. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Once all of that is done, you email green roofs and solar at buildings.nyc.gov and you request a sign off. DOB will then review the documents and if everything's complete, they'll sign off the job, which creates a letter of completion. Then the DOB submits it to the DOF. 
After DOB sign-off is completed, DOB sends list of applications to DOF for processing. DOF sends letter to owner outlining eligibility, eligible expenditures, percentage of property tax deduction, start and end dates of tax abatement. Next slide, please. Okay. So right now, the DOB is proposing to amend the RCNY to add property tax abatement for electrical energy storage systems. And a public hearing was held on the 28th for that. If you're interested, the text can be found on the city record website. And I'm sure Alan will be talking about this a little bit more when he does his presentation. Next slide, please. So let's get into a little bit about the zoning. So the zoning is actually fairly liberal and it allows you to either build a new building to the zoning envelope and then you have some permitted obstructions above that. Or if a building is existing non-compliant, they'll also allow you to take those same permitted obstructions from that. So on slope roofs, which is greater than 20 degrees, you can go 18 inches beyond the zoning envelope. And this also applies to existing non-compliant structures. And that's because many existing buildings in New York City were constructed prior to the, construction, to the current zoning resolution tax. So, Many of the projects that we work on are from buildings prior to 61, so they wouldn't necessarily comply with the existing zoning envelope. Next slide, please. Okay. In the lower zoning districts, the zoning envelope is based upon a perimeter wall height, and then a sloping plane up to 35 feet. Um, so solar installations are allowed on flat roofs without square foot limitations up to a height of four feet, measured from the maximum building height or the existing height of the, bil of the building, whichever is greater. Installations above this four foot height are dependent on the specific zoning district. And the next couple slides, we're gonna show you how you figure the zoning envelope and the four feet and the four foot height for uh, buildings with a sloped plane. Next slide. Okay, uh, next. Okay, so say um, in a lot, we see a lot of flat roof buildings in the lower density zoning districts, which are uh, determined by a sloping plane. And they're usually small and narrow, and they're like row houses. So people wanna put canopies on there because that helps maximize the amount of solar panels that you can put on the roof. Next slide. I mean, next, uh, next. Um, so this would be next. That would be your maximum building height. So your maximum perimeter wall height may vary depending on the district, but in these districts, the maximum building height is usually 35 feet. Next slide. I mean, next, um, yeah. So you can go up four feet from there, next. So basically take that top triangle and just move it up four feet, next. And there you can see that you could put your solar canopy there. Next. Next. Okay. So the, this, in this particular case, the solar canopy support structure can be included in the cost of the system. And make sure that you have nine foot clear under the canopy for the FDNY access path per FC 504.4. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Now we said that you can always go a little higher than the four feet. In the lower density 
um, zoning districts, you can go another two feet up to six feet. Next. 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 Okay. So if you want, you can go past the four feet up to the six feet. However, it has to be set, anything that's at the six feet height has to be set back six feet from the street line and can only occupy 25% of the roof coverage. Next slide. Okay. Zoning resolution allows solar panels as a permitted obstruction four feet above roof level as measured from the maximum permitted building height or the existing height of the building, whichever is greater. So you get the four feet for free. And in R1 to an R5 district, you can go up another two feet to six feet. And in R6 to an R10 district, you can go up another height to 15 feet. However, those portions above the four feet must be set back six feet from the street wall, and the coverage is limited to 25% of the roof area, calculated based on the roof of which solar panels are installed of multiple roofs. Next. Next. Okay, so here you can see we have a building with multiple roofs. So the shaded um, red would represent the upper roof. If we wanted to go above the four feet, we were limited to 25% of that particular roof. Okay, next slide. Okay, the same thing in the commercial districts. For free, you're given four feet above the roof level. In commercial districts mapped within R1 through R5 districts and in C3 and C4-1, you can go up another two feet to six feet. In all other commercial districts and commercial districts mapped within R6 to R10 districts, you can go up to 15 feet. And on a bulkhead, you can go up to six feet. And the same limitations we described for the residential applies here. It's Whenever you go above the four feet, it's limited to 25% of that roof area, and it has to be set back six feet from the street wall. Next slide. And for manufacturing districts, it's a little more stringent. They only allow you to go up an extra two feet to six feet. And again, the same limitations comply. Next slide. Sometimes we have what we call non-conforming buildings. And a non-conforming building is a building that, whose use is not permitted in that particular zoning district. For instance, you might have a residential building in a manufacturing zone. And if you were going to build it, from, from, build it new, it wouldn't be permitted. So that's what non-conforming means. There is something called an incidental alteration. And the definition of that is in Zoning Resolution 1210. And the City Planning Commission has agreed that canopies and solar panels can count as incidental alterations. And you measure it from the existing height of the building not the height of the applicable zoning district. So that's very good because a couple of years ago, we didn't think that you could do anything to a non-conforming building. Okay, next slide. Okay. We talked about this earlier, Local Law 92 and 94. This is going to be coming up a lot in the future because all the new buildings that are being built as of 2019 are now having to make that sustainable roofing zone. And that you can, again, is two buildings bulletin 2019-10. So it applies to projects with construction documents approved on or after November 15th 
unless the construction documents have attained this status K, plan exempt partial approval. Um, you can get a tax abatement for solar panels on these roofs. And if you're going to get a tax abatement, you wouldn't file the solar panels with the building. You would file it as a separate tax abatement application. Okay, next slide. Okay. Some of the buildings that we work on are in the flood zone. So there are some special requirements for that. We want to see a firm and a P firm, and that's going to help us understand where the base flood elevation is. You may need to provide substantial calculations. You'll need to show us the BFE and the DFE, the base flood elevation, the design flood elevation. You may or may not need to have flood zone compliance, but that would only be if it was a substantial improvement. Now, we have to be able to figure out how, where the BFE and the DFE is, and we need a site survey. So the site survey might be onerous to a lower budget project. So we're giving you some options for site surveys. Option one would be to give us a site survey or an elevation certificate within the last year, which is what our general requirement is. However, if you want, you can give us a site survey or an elevation certificate older than one year. But then you would have to give us a statement on an AI-1 saying the site survey is consistent with current site conditions. Then there's a third option when you have absolutely nothing on the walls except the AC disconnects disconnect switch, and everything's located up on the roof, and you have the microinverters under the solar panels. In that case, we don't need a site survey at all, but we do need a, a um, utility certification statement on the drawing. Okay, next slide. Okay. Interesting, Con Edison can put their utility meter whether existing or new, wherever they want. So if they want, it can go below the DFE. But if the, util, um, if the solar company is putting a new meter in or any other new equipment, it must be located above the design flood elevation. Existing equipment may remain in the current location. The exception to this is the AC disconnect switch. That can be located below the DFE, and it must be readily accessible, and the highest position of the handle cannot be more than six feet, seven inches above the ground floor or working platform. Next slide. Okay. Um, some people want, some applicants choose to use a ballasted system as opposed to um, mechanically fastening the panels to the roof. At the present time, the ballasted systems are prohibited above 100 feet. And since New York is in a hurricane zone, you can't use loose aggregate. So the ballasts have to be what they call self-contained and enclosed. And what we mean by self-contained would be like the would be like a concrete block, and it needs to go into some kind of a shoe so that it can't be knocked out of place. Next slide. Something that we're seeing a lot of lately are carports, solar panels on carports. Um, if the installation is on a roof of an existing carport, only a solar application must be filed. Now, if it's a new carport structure, it's a little bit more onerous because the structure and the foundation has to be filed as a GC through DOB now. And actually, the foundations go as FO 
and I think the structure goes as ST, I'm sorry, not GC. And that has to go through DOB now. It's reviewed in the borough for code and zoning compliance. And you can't put the costs of this structure towards the PTA. Once it's approved in the boroughs, then we can go ahead and approve the solar panels. Next slide, please. Okay. This pertains mostly to the borough of Queens where they have these um, configurations, they commonly call them garden apartments. They're very large blocks and there are multiple buildings on the block and sometimes each building is composed of several bins. So like the slide that you're working, that you're looking at, that might have 50 bins on it. So the DOF will give you one, so this is one tax lot with several buildings on the lot. Each building consists of multiple individual bins, as you can see with the green. That structure there actually has maybe seven bins. And for the DOF, they only give you one PTA per lot. So for multiple buildings, the PTA is then divided amongst the bins. And you can, um, and then in that case, you can put them on all the different buildings as long as the total doesn't max out the, to the 62,500. Next slide. Okay. Cluster projects. Projects that consist of one building structure with multiple bins on a single tax lot or projects that consist of clusters of building structures that each contain multiple bins. For the DOF, only one PTA can be issued for any one tax lot. However, if there is more than one building on the tax lot, the PTA can be shared between the buildings and the bins. And you have to basically coordinate with Con Edison the location of the main meter. And I'll explain to you more in the next slide. Okay. So if you want to file a cluster project, you file the application under the bin where the main meter is located. And then you have to provide special wording in the PW1. So under 11, you would say C section number 24 comments for full scope of addresses covered under this application. And in section 24, the comments, you would put a disclaimer about the buildings are all represented by a single owner and you put all the associated bins together. So in this case, each bin doesn't have to have its own application. You can file one application with the multiple bins as long as the application is filed under the building where the main meter is and you put this wording on the PW1. And the DEP will allow you to do one asbestos report for the main bin and the additional bins need to be listed as well. Next slide. Okay, this is an interesting project where you have two buildings, building A and building B. Building A is, is going to get a tax abatement and it has a main meter there and they're gonna be putting solar panels on top of it. Building B is not getting a tax abatement, but it is getting solar panels that are getting tied into building A system. So building A is basically going to be getting all of the energy and the tax abatement, although some of the work is going to be on building B. So let's just talk about how to file something like that. Next slide. Two buildings, two lots. Solar panels are being installed on both buildings to create one system. However, only one building is going to receive the solar energy and the tax abatement. So building A has the solar panels and it's going to feed into the main meter. Building A is going to receive all the solar energy and the tax abatement. 
Building B has panels on the roof that are tied into the system feeding building A, but building B is not getting any of the power or the tax abatement. So the way you would file something like that is, next slide. Okay. So for building A, you would file that as a solar tax um, abatement application. And the PW3 and the PTA4 would include the costs of all the panels, both on buildings A and buildings B. And on the PW1, you would just reference building B in section 11. For building B, you still have to file an application because you're doing construction work but it's going to be a non-PTA application. And the wording in Section 11 would be the installation of solar energy system on roof, no change of use, egress, or occupancy, work is being paid for under job, and that would be the application number for Building A. Next slide. Okay, so for that case, Building B, you can just do a PW3 for $1. And you will need to file a restrictive declaration or an easement, depending on whether or not the buildings are owned separately or um, individually. And interesting, the fire department wants each building to have its own fire path. So you can't just do one fire path for both buildings. Each one has to have a front to back and side to side. Okay, next slide. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope this was helpful. Next slide. If you have any questions, green roof and solar at buildings.nyc.gov. That's the main web, um, the main email, and then that'll get forwarded over to me or someone else as required to answer your questions. Thank you again. Now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Alan Price, director of the OTCR unit. Alan, you're still on mute. We can't hear you yet, Alan. Uh, excellent. Oh, there you are. Thank you very much, Alan. And this has been invaluable information. If you need to take a few extra minutes, since we're we're running a little bit long here, I think that the uh, attendees will appreciate getting the full measure of your presentation. Yeah, I think we should be able to uh, work with our 2 p.m. time slot. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, attending uh, this workshop and I appreciate the time that was offered to the Department of Buildings to present this material. Uh, my name is Alan Price, Director of the Office of Technical Certification and Research with the Department of Buildings. My colleague Barry Stein just presented information on uh, solar permitting as well as uh, information for property tax abatements on solar and energy storage systems. Regarding energy storage systems, I'd like to further dis the discussion and talk about the material acceptance requirements for energy storage systems. So this will have to do with the safety of the equipment, making sure that whatever equipment is used is being used in a safe manner. So uh, this uh, presentation will actually focus on what's called project requirements for energy storage systems. Uh, if you have been on our website lately, you'll start to see things called project requirements. Uh, these project requirements uh, is an organization uh, for presenting material uh, for given topics, given installations uh, that uh, require permitting with the Department of Buildings. Energy storage, of course, is one of those. And uh, 
the project requirements are designed to help manage project responsibilities and determine who's doing what on the projects. Uh, we have a couple already published on our website, a couple of project requirements. You'll find them for such things such as boilers, solar systems, sprinklers, et cetera. But we do not have one yet for energy storage systems. We will be working on those and developing those project requirements and posting them on our website. But nonetheless, I think the format and the organization that is used for these project requirements are helpful in communicating the requirements for energy storage systems and the approval and acceptance by the Department of Buildings. Next slide. Okay, the format consists uh, for project requirements, that is the format consists of code applicability, zoning provisions, construction document submissions, inspections, and this one at the end, I add it to the presentation that is for sign off as well. Typically, we don't have sign off on project requirements, but again, for purposes of this presentation, I did want to make sure I include that information. Next slide. Okay, we'll start from the beginning. Uh, code applicability. So whenever you go on our website and pull up one of these project requirements web pages, you will see the very first thing uh, that would be presented will be code applicability. These are all the applicable codes, code sections, references, any type of regulations uh, that would per pertain to uh, the product or installation in question. For energy storage systems, what is key here is that it is an alternative. So we do have requirements for some energy storage systems. However, we have, we have some code requirements, pardon me, uh, that are published for energy storage systems. However, we have determined that those requirements uh, do not uh, go far enough for regulating energy storage systems as they are used today in buildings. So we have deemed that energy storage systems are alternatives to the code. And as an alternative to the code, we have some guidance in our administration in, in our administrative code as to how we can go about uh, accepting uh, alternative materials. Uh, two things, they have to demonstrate compliance with the intent of the code. So if the code has certain things in it for similar systems, uh, certain requirements for similar systems, that's kind of the intent of the code. Those same requirements would be applied to the product or the installation in question. And then we also look to equivalency. So what we mean by equivalency is that uh, the code may require certain safety levels or uh, durability uh, levels uh, for certain types of equipment, we would expect uh, to meet those uh, levels that have already been established by the code through equivalency. So that's what we look for as an alternative material. And certainly that's what we look for with energy storage systems. Uh, with code applicability, you see some of the other structural analysis from BC chapter 16. Uh, flood hazard uh, requirements in Appendix G. We also listed some FDNY requirements and electrical code requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, when we, uh, again, moving down in the list of our project requirements, we have zoning provisions that, uh, of course, will be presented. And with energy storage systems, we really have two bulletins that you should be aware of. Uh, the first one, 2019-007, clarifies the applicable zoning use group for non-accessory energy storage systems. And Buildings Bulletin 2020-023 clarifies the applicable limitations for uh, accessory energy storage systems. Next slide, please. Uh, and then maybe I should have st uh, stayed on that prior slide, but you can stay here, that's fine. Uh, zoning is really not part of the OTCR review process. Uh, it is not part of the material acceptance 
uh, that we consider, at least not formally part of it. Uh, however, we do check for zoning under the OTCR review to make sure that it is complete. Uh, applicants will work with the borough offices on zoning, uh, on, on obtaining an approved zoning analysis from the department. OTCR, again, just as a reminder, will check to make sure that those, uh, that the applicant has obtained a, an approved zoning analysis. Okay, construction submission. Uh, construction document submission. That is the next item in our project requirements list. And uh, the very first thing you should know, and uh, this is probably the first time I'm saying this at uh, this workshop, is that uh, all energy storage systems will be now filed under DOB now. So before uh, these projects were filed under our BIS system, we are now uh, asking that all projects be filed under DOB now. You will be following them as a GC, general construction work type. We are developing a new work type specifically for energy storage systems. So I would be on the lookout for that when that comes out. But under that filing, uh, of course, uh, there will be a requirement for OTCR review. So that is for the alternative material review, which we spoke about a few slides ago. That, re that review, uh, we've kind of boiled it down to what we call the OTCR checklist. Here is everything that you need to submit to us. It's contained in this checklist. And you can see that we have nine sections for the checklist. These nine items in this checklist have been presented before. So if you attended one of these workshops before, or if you have submitted an application to us in the past, you will be very familiar with these nine categories for the checklist. Uh, you can see that, uh, for instance, item number four is for plans. And here we outline all the requirements that you will need on the plans that will be submitted to the department. Item number six as another example, certifications, all of the requirements for a certification or test report, such as UL 9540 listing requirements or certification requirements and UL 9540A test, testing requirements and test reports that again will be required as part of this checklist. Next slide, please. What is new regarding the checklist is just a new format that we are using to uh, provide to applicants and to also collect, uh, organize, and uh, keep track of uh, all of the documents that we do require. This is also our way of communicating information to applicants regarding all of the items that we will need and the different items that we will be looking at for our evaluation. So I apologize uh, for the small text here. It may be very difficult to read at home and I, I understand that completely. I'm gonna try just to quickly just go through this. Uh, and hopefully it'll make sense to you guys. What, what is being represented on this uh, slide is the checklist for the plans. That was item number four on our checklist. And here at the, uh, what's being represented is the requirements for our site and battery plan. You will note in the column, uh, I will call that column C, hopefully you can see column C, for description, you will see that all of the different types of information that we want represented on, on our site plan are included here on column C. In column E, we list just the objective, why, why we're listing this, right? Why, why do we require the information from column C? And then in column F, this is a column that will be very useful to applicants that we did not publish before. We are now publishing, and this is a requirement uh, 
it's, this is actually the requirement. What we are looking at when we give consideration uh, to a particular item. So for instance, if you see at the bottom of the page, I kind of I highlighted those three columns that I just went over. This, again, this is for the site plan, but on the site plan, we would be looking for distances to adjacent construction. That's the description or requirement we're looking for. We would also be looking to identify, our goal, of course, is to identify any nearby exposures. And then the requirements for acceptance would be under uh, column F, which is the last column down below. And that we are getting from the FDNY rule uh, for distances to adjacent construction. What would be acceptable? So if uh, you are submitting plans and you are below the distances outlined in the FDNY rule, 3 RCNY 608-01, we would not accept that. So applicants can get an idea of what would be acceptable in accordance with our new checklist. I think this is a huge improvement. It certainly provides a lot more transparency than what we had before, which was just a list of the requirements and not the actual criteria that we'll be using for the evaluation. Next slide, please. Okay, and just taking a look at time, I'm two minutes over. I'm gonna go real quick on these next few slides. Uh, regarding construction documents, uh, plans, we'll also require plans uh, such as, I mentioned two of them already, the site plan and battery plan but we will also be looking to collect information on architectural plans, sprinkler alarm detection, fire detection, structural and zoning. Next slide. The certifications under checklist item six, as highlighted before, I listed two of those already. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention though to the last one, which is for a peer review, actually, we are no longer requiring a peer review. We have a consultant on board uh, that is working with us that, would, that will actually work with the applicant to go over the testing data that has been presented for the equipment, for the energy storage equipment. And they will review how that testing data has been applied by the registered design professional. So the peer review is no longer a requirement. Okay, next slide, please. And after, of course, uh, all those items are submitted, reviewed, and OTCR issues our conditional acceptance letter, we will outline requirements for inspections. So in that letter, we will uh, actually uh, let you know that uh, special inspections will be required, but only for related work. We do not have a special inspection category yet for energy storage systems. So special inspections is required for, uh, for instance, any concrete or anything like that. If you're pouring a pad outside installations, something like that. Commissioning, we are also requiring commissioning for medium and large systems. The commissioning can be performed by the manufacturer. We do not have a format yet for commissioning. So the manufacturer can choose any format they want. However, the report will be submitted to OTCR reviewed and accepted, and accepted by OTCR. Lastly, as far as inspections are concerned, I'm calling this an inspection. Uh, this is a requirement for the registered design professional to certify compliance with our conditional acceptance letter. Any requirements in that letter must be complied with and the RDP will outline, I'm sorry, will certify compliance with those items. Next item, please. Lastly, once we receive that uh, certification from the registered design professional, OTCR will issue our final acceptance letter. This letter is required uh, before sign-off. 
So you will not be able to sign off on the project that was filed and permitted by the boroughs until OTCR issues the final acceptance letter. That will be recorded in, of course, uh, DOB now. And some of the projects that are still out there, of course, that final acceptance letter is recorded in this. Okay, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. And certainly if there's any questions at all regarding material acceptance for energy storage systems, please feel free to use the contact information on this slide and we'll be more than happy to assist. Thank you so much. I will turn this over now to Lori. Thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, both Barry and Alan's presentations. And yes, all the presentations will be up on the uh, New York solar map uh, in the next couple of business days. And all of your unanswered questions will be sent to um, the appropriate agency and those will be posted as well. We're gonna take one more minute and do another workshop question for you just to keep you all on your toes and let you know that we're here to listen to you as well. So once again, look at the Q and A portion of your Zoom down below. If you don't have a full screen, you gotta hit the more button. If you're not on the screen, come back to the Zoom screen and follow that link. This is another link. Uh, and you'll see, you should be led to a question that looks very similar to what's on the screen right now, but you can now answer it. So take one minute. Uh, what resources and tools could be developed to support you to do more business in New York City? These are check boxes. Won't take you but 30 seconds to let us know so we can better help the market, better help you. And don't forget to hit submit. So we can do that as our panelists are approaching the stage, so to speak. Remember those days? Uh, All right. All right, now I'll direct your attention back to your Zoom screen. And if our panelists can please uh, hit their video and I'm going to do just a brief introduction so everybody knows who they're talking to, uh, who we're talking to. Uh, we have uh, Zach Dufresne. He has been, he began his role as the executive director of NICEA in November of 2021 with a background in renewable energy policy and market analysis prior to joining NICEA. Zach performed in in-depth clean energy policy analysis and contributed to energy market forecasting for distributed energy resources in various states across the Northeast. Um, and then we have Ellie Kahn with us today. She is the Senior Policy Advisor at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Her work focuses on solar, decarbonization as a housing stability and health strategy, and economic development in green sectors. In this role, she helped pass local laws 92 and 94, which require solar or green roof on new buildings in New York City. Welcome, Ellie. We have Shai Mehta, he is an assistant director at NYSERDA and is part of NYSERDA's distributed energy resource and energy storage teams, where his portfolio focuses on policy design, implementation and stakeholder engagement related to distributed solar and storage. Prior to NYSERDA, he spent three years as executive director of NYSEA, where he advocated for advancement of policy relating to siting, permitting, interconnection, incentives, and compensation for New York's distributed solar sector. And we also have Denise Sheehan. She serves as senior advisor to the New York Battery and Energy Storage Technology Consortium, we know as New York Best. In her role, Ms. Sheehan coordinates New York Best policy and regulatory affairs activities. She also provides advice and oversight of New York Best strategic direction and operational management including member relations, communications, and program development. She has more than 35 years of management experience in government and nonprofit sectors. Welcome everybody. Uh, now you can all unmute yourself. And are we missing somebody? We got everybody? Terrific. Thank you. So we'll just jump right into the panel here. 
the city and state has established and expanded gigawatt deployment goals. So what do you see as the best ways to get there? And what are each of you focused on to support reaching these goals? So let's start with our state representative first. Uh, what policies are gonna make the difference here? Yeah, thanks, Laurie. And, and thank you to CUNY for, for having uh, me and, and having nice sort of participate at, at, on this panel. So, um, you know, I think the state has, uh, in the last few months, you know, indicated its intention to continue scaling up the distributed solar uh, market uh, across the state and in the city through the um, through the filing of the 10 gigawatt roadmap. Um, I think most folks um, in the audience will probably be aware about that, but just in case uh, you're not, uh, this was essentially a proposal to um, chart a pathway to an expanded uh, goal for distributed solar uh, in New York with a uh, to towards a target of a, an, an expanded target of 10 gigawatts of distributed solar deployment by 2030. So, you know, um, folks may be aware that we we have uh, one uh, distributed solar goal that is um, enshrined in the CLC Bay in the climate law, which is six gigawatts. Uh, by the end of 2025. So, you know, we are um, in a really good place to meet that goal actually ahead of target. If you look at what's already been installed, uh, which is in excess of three gigawatts DC. And um, there's a, an, another two plus gigawatts in the pipeline at a relatively mature stage of development uh, that will get us um, to that six gigawatt goal again, I, I think comfortably before the end of 2025. So the question from stakeholders for the last, I would say year and a half almost has been what's coming next. So, um, and so the first step towards that, uh, towards determining what's next is uh, came, uh, came through an announcement that Governor Hochul made uh, at Climate Week last September when she announced the 10 gigawatt goal and then she directed NYSERDA and DPS to file a roadmap to chart a pathway to that goal. And we say, when we say chart a pathway, um, it means um, essentially uh, proposed market support mechanisms and related recommendations on other key matters, like for example, interconnection, as well as uh, really crucial considerations on equity um, that you know, I think it's fair to say we, we are still not delivering on in terms of distributed solar's promise. So anyway, going back to um, just the high level. So that proposal was filed back in December and, we, and um, you know, we've, we've seen very robust uh, set of uh, public comments from stakeholders across the board, including NICEA uh, and, um, and the city, i.e. MOCEJ. Um, and um, that I'm, I'm uh, optimistic that the commission will uh, rule on that petition relatively soon. And of course, you know, we're really all crossing our fingers that the, at least at NYSERDA, that the, that the proposal or the roadmap is, is approved or perhaps approved with some modifications based on the, uh, the comments we've received. So, so that's one, um, you know, one big piece at, at, a, at a high level. And then for storage, um, again, folks may, uh, are probably aware, uh, but just in case not, I uh, just want to um, you know, make clear that um, as part of the state of the state address from Governor Hochul this January, she announced an expanded target of, uh, for, for uh, energy storage in New York of, of six gigawatts of deployment by the end of 2030. So again, in terms of existing goals, what we already had was a CLCPM mandate with three gigawatts of storage by 2030, and then an interim target of 1.5 gigawatts by 2025. Um, and um, we, we have begun our process of meeting that interim target. I think there are a few more challenges there than we've seen in solar for a couple of different reasons. Um, but, you know, just again, going back to your question, you know, uh, uh, you know, and repeating myself, that the, I think those two announcements or the, the proposal and the, the, uh, the six gigawatt announcement for storage, which also similarly uh, to the DG solar uh, announcement, um, as part of that state of the state announcement for the, the, the updated storage target, uh, Governor Hochul also directed NYSERDA and DPS to file a similar roadmap, an updated roadmap for storage that charts the pathway to that six gigawatt target, which we are 
uh, in the process of, of developing right now at NYSERDA, uh, collaborating with DPS. Um, so again, those, you know, I think that that really shows at a high level that the state is, you know, highly committed to continue to scale up the digital market. Uh, same thing with storage. And, um, um, and you know, when it comes to storage, you know, um, the, there will be, um, you know, we have different segments of the storage industry. We have the residential segment, we have the retail segment that receives compensation through the VDR tariff, and then we have the bulk storage projects as well. So, you know, it's going to take a, um, it's going to take all three of these segments playing playing their roles to help us reach that 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 what is a very ambitious six gigawatt target, um, and um, you know there's a lot more I can say in terms of the sort of um, lower level you know policy implementation recommendations and from you know the state's perspective and NYSERDA's perspective what needs to happen to um, to realize those goals. But let me just stop there and allow my uh, other my fellow panelists to chime in as well. Thank you very much, Sam. Let's let's turn to Ellie for New York City and your your thoughts on policies that are going to you know actual tangible methodology that's going to help us get to city goals. Chris, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so I don't know that we necessarily need lots of new policy to get there. We have a lot in place. I think it's a matter of now implementation. Um, if you've listened to the mayor anytime recently, you've probably heard him say getting stuff done or even condensed to GSD. And that's really going to be a major focus of this administration. You're working with the things that we already have on the books and that we need to make sure actually happen. Um, with that, uh, we are particularly interested in the New York State Climate Act and the scoping plan that the state um, and its, its uh, advisory committee put forward, um, basically trying to figure out how we get to carbon neutrality. Um, so that is going to be an essential document and I encourage you all to weigh in as well. Um, in New York City in particular, we're very interested in that because um, the Climate Act requires 40% of the benefits um, of that decarbonization strategy accrue to what are called disadvantaged communities. Um, if you look statewide, the census tracts that the state has preliminarily identified as disadvantaged communities, about 60% of those are in New York City, which means that we will need to have a lot more investment in renewables and energy efficiency and, and electrification and things like that in New York City. Of course, we have sort of a unique set of uh, challenges in, in terms of the built environment and socioeconomic uh, demographics, things like that. Um, so we will need to be working on things that suit the needs of New York City, um, potentially more so than has been done to date. Um, the city's comments to the solar roadmap really emphasize the importance of Con Ed territory in achieving the state's goals under the Climate Act. Um, and we will continue uh, saying that over and over again um, whenever we have the chance. Um, in addition, on the city level, we have Local Law 97 and the Climate Mobilization Act. Um, for those who are not, who've never heard of it before, um, Local Law 97 requires large buildings to progressively reduce their operational carbon emissions um, with a goal of net zero by 2050. So it's not a design standard, it's really like how much energy you are using on an annual basis, what is the carbon intensity of that energy that you are using. So right now, the rules are being written. The first compliance period will be 2024, um, but that doesn't give people tons of time at this point to start doing the energy efficiency upgrades, the clean energy um, uh, installations that they need to be able to comply. I wanna emphasize that uh, renewables, RECs, and storage are all highlighted um, in the law and are all different compliance pathways. The exact details are still being determined though, so keep an eye on that. Um, we do already, like I mentioned, we have strong laws, but they're only going to be effective if we implement them thoughtfully. We need um, all of the voices in this room to help us um, design things that make sense and that will work um, and, you know, focus on, the, on the, the objectives and the goals and the policies that we already have today. Thank you, Ellen. I'm going to turn to Zach from NYSEA for a minute um, about how the solar industry, what strategies um, you're working on to get to you know, not just government policy goals, but your own goals. And I, I can't help but wondering uh, with what's happening to the cost of fuel elsewhere, if that just makes your voice be heard a little bit more. Thanks, Lori. I appreciate uh, the invite here and the introduction. And I'll say we can only hope. Um, I think there's an obvious correlation there that, that uh, we're looking to, to bring to light here. 
Um, I'm going to differ from my my friend at Nicerta, my, my predecessor, Shyam, and, and I'm glad you kind of opened the door for me that for this. Um, you know, I think there's there's more work to be done than this 10 gigawatt roadmap. Um, and we have our, our sites set a lot higher than 10 gigawatts by 2030, probably more, more than 10 by 2030, and then a lot more after that. Um, so to get there, we're looking at, at really rate modernization as, as one of the biggest keys that includes VEDA reform. Uh, we've done a lot of work towards that effort. Uh, we appreciate the, the New York Sun roadmap as a kind of, you know, looking at it as a, as a kind of interim, these incentives were, were desperately needed at this juncture because it's been dry for a while. Um, but we're looking to, to get back to work on advanced rate modernization, rate design. Um, really looking for a more market-based long-term solution. Uh, you know, again, with our eyes set beyond 10 gigawatts by 2030. Um, so something that properly values solar and really getting out of this incentive business once and for all. Um, so grid modernization, uh, different than rate modernization, I think is another key aspect of getting there. That includes interconnection reform. Uh, we're currently you know, looking at advanced tech like flexible interconnection and, uh, you know, working on some, some new ideas there. Um, also looking towards better cost sharing where it's not just the industry uh, kind of paying for the, the full utility upgrades. Um, and then future planning. Uh, we're doing a lot of ad hoc upgrades right now. Uh, we have a planning process, DSIP, but it's pretty broken at this point. Um, CGPP is ramping up and that is showing some promise. Um, but really need the state to facilitate an expedient process with the utilities, with stakeholders to upgrade the grid and the interconnection processes. Um, so I guess it's it's also worth noting, you know, the grid operators play a key role here, not just in, in interconnection and um, grid upgrades, but also things like CDG billing and crediting and net crediting for remote crediting, which was presented earlier by Con Ed. It's, it's great to have those concepts in place and those programs in place, the kind of, um, you know, as, as Ellie was suggesting, implementation is, is key here. Um, so really need to, to work out the kinks of some of those programs in an efficient manner. Um, one other bucket I'll mention is uh, permitting zoning codes reform, uh, obviously a big topic of conversation here today. Uh, we're looking for you know more expedient processes. Don't want to skirt the rules. Don't want to sidestep safe, uh, sidestep safety. Um, but you know, realizing this is new tech, we just don't have really super efficient processes in place yet for for getting these things approved. So we look forward to working with state and local agencies on the best way to tackle these issues. Um, you know, we're looking at automated software for residential permitting as a solar app plus software that NREL has developed that, that has great promise. Um, working on you know, changes to property tax and, and all kinds of evaluation models. Ultimately, you know, we wanna see solar plus storage incorporated everywhere feasible and all new construction and major renovation as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, understand the city has a rule for this, but you know, also seeing some loopholes to that rule. So again, just tightening things up um, and making sure that, you know, ultimately we meet our goals. Um, I guess I will mention one more thing uh, and before I kick it to Denise here. We're going to get there by getting our benefits to disadvantaged communities, right? Um, Shyam mentioned there's a, there's a bit of a lag there. Um, we've actually seen LMI market share in New York decrease from 2010 to 2020. Um, which is opposite of a national trend where LMI market share is increasing everywhere else in New York, it's decreasing. So I really want to buck that trend uh, where, you know, LSR takes takes time to build and, and we're kind of well positioned here to be speedily getting these projects at the load source and, and benefiting disadvantaged communities. So we're looking at more innovative ways to do that. Um, the draft criteria for disadvantaged communities that's kind of tied to this Climate Action Council scoping plan is a potential avenue there. We're looking to get involved in that. Um, more robust uh, community, inclusive community solar adder through 10 gigawatt roadmap. I'd love to see that happen. Uh, we're looking at, we have a campaign to do changes to the residential solar tax credit to make it refundable, uh, more attractive for LMI customers. Um, and yeah, just, just again, really making sure that we accomplish that 40% disadvantaged communities goal. I'll stop there. 
Thank you. Well, Denise, um, boy, storage has come a long way <laughs> since we first it's, opened up that door. It's music in my, to my storage. ears. Yes. Music yeah, to my everybody ears. was talking about storage now. So as far as these goals, looking to the future, yep. how, what, are, what are you looking at? What is New York Fest looking at? And because you, you have the, the ear of all of the manufacturing companies and mm -hmm. storage companies. So what, what's the future planning here? So um, first, thank you, Lori, and thank you to CUNY for having your best here and to my fellow panelists. Hello, I see you guys all the time, but Ellie, I haven't met you, so nice to meet you. Um, you know, as you said, storage has come a long way. We are, you know, the first place that we start, obviously, is exactly where Shiam was talking about. We are really excited about the governor, um, including energy storage in the state of the state and, you know, the commitment to do a new roadmap. It's extremely important for us to get the markets for storage moving again. We're, we're sort of in a a little bit of a holding pattern as the last roadmap we we've, we've used up the funds and um you know we there's still some remaining barriers that still need to be addressed so this next roadmap i i think we're it's wonderful that we're hitting the ground running you know NYSERDA is very committed and the department of public service so we're excited about the the prospects around that new roadmap so that's really number one and, you know, clearly there will be a lot in there with respect to, you know, market incentives, new, new procurement programs, um, new ways to deploy storage in New York um, at all of those three levels that Shiam talked about, residential, uh, retail, and bulk. Um, so, but there are still barriers to storage, which we have to address head on. Um, there's a few obviously around interconnection, you know, economics, exciting permitting, things that we've all talked about and we all experience. Um, so, you know, addressing those in a in a comprehensive way, I think will be really helpful. Um, beyond the roadmap, I would say, you know, futuristically, um, the storage industry and, and New York Best in particular, we, we recognize a really critical role for long duration storage. Um, to get to a zero, a net zero grid, we're going to need storage that can last longer than four hours. Um, if we're going to replace fossil peakers, um, we're going to need duration that uh, batteries that are, and long duration storage technologies that can last for longer periods of time. So the industry as a whole is focused on that as well. Um, you know, in New York Best also works on an ecosystem level, and thank you for bringing that up to talk about, um, you know, the investments being made in the industry that we really have an opportunity in New York and domestically to grow this industry and beyond just, you know, installation of storage, but really from the technology development, testing, the supply chain, and, and there's a recognition in the White House throughout the Department of Energy to New York State, that there's a huge opportunity still um, to be had. So New York Best is very much engaged in that as well. Um, you know, so, you know, we're working on, so on all those different levels and workforce development is another piece that we're very interested in developing new training and certificate programs in conjunction with um, the city and the state. So there's a lot of different um, avenues that New York Best is involved in, and we're excited, we're very, very much excited about the future. So I'll stop there because I know you have lots of questions that may get us into some of more, some more granular questions. Actually, okay. Lauren, before we move on, can I just jump back in? Sure. Sorry, because I realized I didn't actually answer your question. Um, I just spent my time kind of uh, broadcasting the state's goals, which you know I thought was important to to broadcast because they are the starting point when the, as far as the state is concerned. But really in terms of, you know, didn't get to talk, uh, get to talking about either New York City specifically or specific policies. So just really quickly. So, I mean, I uh, agree with Ellie for most part that, um, that in terms of, you know, policy innovation, it, it's the, there probably needs to be less focus on that in most areas compared to implementation going forward with a couple of exceptions, which is, you know, for solar, I would say, uh, you know, Zach mentioned the two really key topics, I think, um, that are especially pertinent to New York City. 
um, which is uh, interconnection reform and continual improvement. And uh, there specifically, you know, from my perspective, and I'll just take all my other, you know, state and um, other hats off for a second. Uh, in, uh, you know, there's two things. One is I think Zach alluded to the framework for the allocation and uh, of costs for grid upgrades, which you know, I, I tend to not be a huge barrier for smaller projects in New York City, but as you get to, you know, 750 KW and above, they can be prohibitive, just like they're upstate. Uh, and Massachusetts has, has advanced a very interesting uh, 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 piece of policy in that regard that actually uh, does socialize a, a portion of the upgrade costs, where there is a, a, a clear case that there's a wider array of beneficiaries other than just the interconnecting projects. So, um, so that's definitely one point. Second is, you know, right now the uh, interconnection, the standardized interconnection process we have in New York through the SIR, uh, the timeline and the process is identical for a 51 kW behind the meter system as it is for a five megawatt uh, export only system. That does just uh, doesn't make a ton of sense to me. So if we're looking to accelerate um, uh, development and deployment in the city, especially, especially where projects tend to be smaller, um, um, you know, I think having a dedicated process or, or, or for smaller commercial systems that is more streamlined uh, with shorter timelines, more expedited study is important. And, and just full disclosure, I, I was advocating for that as, as while at NICEA for a number of years, and, and that's still being discussed at the working groups. And then the other point Zach mentioned is rate design. Uh, again, you know, agree with with Zach there, I think, and that's something that you know, at, at NYSERDA sort of, we've started, we've just started to look at, but looking at very closely in terms of rate design structures that enable uh, that enable uh, DER adoption, uh, home DER adoption technologies, uh, most generally, but specifically uh, PV plus storage and EV charging. So that's I think is absolutely crucial that that uh, we need more policy innovation there as well. And then the third thing I'll point to for solar is. Um, just again, repeat, you know, we, uh, uh, that um, what, we, what we need more innovation, and this is something the city has actually called us out on in the comments is um, uh, DAC benefits. So right now, really the only sort of meaningful benefit we're providing through New York Sun to DACs, a disadvantaged community, uh, is uh, in incentives to companies that then use those to transfer benefits in terms of bill savings for residential uh, resident for for residential solar owners and community solar subscribers. So we we can and we should do a better job in terms of more expansive set of uh, providing more expensive set of benefits there. And then we've also just begun the the process of of trying to trying to define and um, and and, uh, and 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 work through a process uh, that lands in terms of community developed and community owned solar. Um, so. Uh, and then, the, and so storage. You know, I think um, I'm just personally learning about 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 storage. But I can tell you, as far as the bulk storage program is concerned, and I don't know how many in this audience are part of that segment, but there are a lot of challenges. Uh, a lot of them come down to market design. Uh, you know, and, and 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 I'm speaking about NISO capacity accreditation as one of the key sort of uh, parts of that puzzle. But then, as Denise alluded to, siting and permitting of outdoor storage. Um, is is still challenging, and then of course we're all very very excited and optimistic and hopeful that we will find a, we'll have a pathway to permit indoor storage. And when that happens, or even in, in you know before that happens, what would be really great to see is uh, policy innovation that allows for an aggregation for aggregation of of behind the meter storage to participate um, in markets in terms of either dynamic load management uh, tariffs or 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 virtual power plant. Uh, models for wholesale market participation. So, um, so those are the areas I would identify as needing more innovation. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, when I when I talk about these goals, I really don't want to give people the sense that what I was trying to say is, you know, we have these goals. We're all good. We're going to get there because, quite honestly, um, I think the current environment we're in, uh, most specifically when it comes to supply chain pricing and availability and inflation, that, that is raising some serious serious challenges. Uh, I am personally quite anxious that you know even the 1.5 billion dollar proposal that we filed for DG Solar, um, you know, may the purse strings may start getting tightened or, or, um, or stretched because we are seeing significant increases in panel pricing, in battery pricing, and then of course on the labor side as well. So that is something that we see as a really key challenge right now, and probably possibly over the next few years, and still trying to you know grapple with how 
uh, how much more tightness there could be in the market, how, how much further prices could go up. And then of course the state has to think about solving for that you know, expanded missing money factor. So that's something very close close to our minds. And, and even uh, delivering on the DAC benefits, it's, you know, we're embarking on a very ambitious path here that we never have. So there's a lot of challenges and work ahead of us. You know, I definitely don't want to give people the sense that once you have the goals in place, like we are there, the goals are just a starting point and uh, we have a lot of obstacles to work through. So thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Let's, let's, uh, let's stay on the topic of the current environment for the moment. And let's talk about what, um, you know, Denise and Zach, you're seeing as the, the current market trends from your manufacturers, from your installers, um, what they're seeing in their market. Um, Denise, I'm going to go back to you for a moment. And how many how many companies now do you have as members of New York Best? And I'm assuming then I'm very curious to, you know, companies change and go, but where they're going right now with their technology. So we have about 185 different members. So, and they run the gamut. So it's there, there's some that are, you know, startups developing new technologies as well as some more traditional developers. So, you know, so if I talk in the context of traditional developers, you know, there is definitely, um, you know, we're hearing a lot about the squeeze on the domestic supply chain. Um, you know, if this was, if we had had this conversation before the pandemic, we were, you know, the, the trend was clearly, and the gl global forecast by all the experts were, you know, the prices were going to drop and we were going to see the same type of cost curve that solar saw. And that was the same thing that was projected um, for storage. Right now, that's not the case. Um, you know, there's definitely been supply chain disruption um, and, you know, increased demand with respect to, you know, EV manufacturing. So those, so what was forecasted has not really come to pass. So there is a tremendous amount of competition right now for, uh, you know, what is a, 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 a resource that is difficult to get your hands on. I saw this morning that, you know, President Biden's talk about using his wartime, um, this just, I just saw this this morning, wartime uh, powers to help grow the domestic battery supply chain in New York, in, uh, in the US. So, um, you know, I think that it's a real issue. Um, and I think it, if we have that type of, you know, federal involvement, it will help, you know, it will help move that move the needle, but it's not going to be, you know, in the, in the near term, it'll be it won't be the next six months. Thank you, Denise. I'm going to go to Linda Zach. Ellie, um, not only New York City, of course, get the, you know, right in the heart of policies for solar and for storage, but also in the sense, the consumer, you know, with, you know, for example, the NYCHA solar program and so forth. So the current trend, the current state of New York City when it comes to solar uh, and, and of course storage, um, what you're seeing and the, the appetite maybe that all the different agencies uh, as a market has for solar. Yeah, I mean, um, some of the, I think I saw some agency folks on the line today, but who might have better insight, um, but New York City Housing Authority and also the Department of Citywide Administrative Services um, have somewhat accelerated how much solar they are install, installing on properties and also beginning to explore storage which is excellent um, from a public sector perspective because those facilities can be very useful for first responders and other sort of emergency types of situations. So very excited and the, 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 um, the pace is accelerating. Um, with 20, 2021 was a really excellent year for um, public sector solar and we're hoping that that trend keeps going. Thank you, Ellie. So Zach, not only for Nicaea in New York, but I'm sure with when you're talking to your, your, your fellow solar gurus across the country through the national organization, what, what do you see as the market trend for solar? Yeah, so I guess I, I mentioned one already in relation to the kind of national trend versus New York trend. Um, we are, we're certainly seeing an increase in storage interest, if you will, um, you know, pairing projects with storage. I think that's a lot of the reason why, why we're here today. Um, prices are going up. Um, 
that's certainly a, a concerning trend uh, kind of across the board. There's some, some new prevailing wage requirements on, on solar projects now. Um, the you know, Department of Commerce just initiated an investigation on foreign solar panels. That's pretty troubling. Um, but you know, on the positive side, we've seen projects get bigger and bigger and cheaper and cheaper to build. Uh, so that's you know, a great trend. Um, I'm, I'm talking about just distributed projects too. Like the number of projects is increasing and the size of those projects is increasing. Um, so I think, you know, looking forward a little bit to what we see as emerging trends, um, we see probably increased interest in, you know, more than one DER electrif electrification solution at a time. Um, so, you know, folks adding not just an EV charger, but an EV charger, storage, uh, smart panels, heat pump, and solar. Um, and then as the state pushes these electrification efforts, we think it links, makes a lot of sense to kind of bundle these if possible, right? Look towards ways to save consumers money uh, by going even further with their electrification. Um, so, and, you know, obviously we see solar as really the catalyst for, for a lot of this. Um, it can make all those other changes more affordable, you know, especially as mentioned after this winter, people are pretty, pretty on edge receiving such high electricity bills um, and the potential volatility associated with fossil fuel generation. Um, so not to mention the safety concerns of fossil fuel generation in, in high density areas, um, you know, we see really taking over the market, right? That's, that's the idea here. Well, Zach, if you had, for example, the ear of maybe one of the top policy people in the state and in the city right next to you, what would you, is there any place you would point them to look, another state, another region, another area of how they are implementing solar or storage? So what suggestions would you have for our state or city policymakers as far as a place to look? Yes, yeah, so um, Xiao mentioned interconnection in Massachusetts. I think that's a really great example. So there's there's not I'll say there's not one state that's doing it all right, but there's pieces we can pull from other states. Um, so I would mention the solar mandate. I think California's solar mandate on all new buildings is kind of the gold standard there. Um, they also have granted AHJs uh, the ability to adopt the solar app that I mentioned earlier to streamline permitting processes. Um, and they've instituted pretty reasonable fire code requirements uh, that allow storage to be widely deployed in you know, high density populations and, and elsewhere. Um, also with energy storage, I would point to Connecticut. Uh, their incentive program, uh, you know, it's slated to deploy at least 580 megawatts over the next eight years. Uh, that's a combination of rebate and pay, pay for performance program, uh, really aimed at reducing peak demand, right, every summer weekday. Um, and it's designed to be a net benefit for all ratepayers. So again, as, as we're talking about getting out of this incense, uh, incentive and subsidies game, um, you know, this, this is a subsidy free design. Uh, so I think New York could set up something similar, statewide program for resi and commercial to begin leveraging the value of DERs. Do you see any urban areas that are ahead of New York City? In terms of storage, certainly. Storage. I, I, I mean, I think, yeah, if I would say, you know, New York City is one of the hardest, if not the hardest places to, to put up storage. Um, and we're seeing similar, you know, same systems implemented uh, and getting pretty good penetration in some in huge cities across the country. Um, realizing that, that New York City is its own beast um, and has its own challenges. Certainly don't want to take away from the, the amazing work that FDNY is doing and, and DOB down there. Um, but we do see some some opportunities there to maybe streamline the process and, and heard about some good ones this morning. So again, don't don't want to take away from the, the process or progress that's already been made and the work that's being done. Um, but we do look for, you know, as much as we can contribute to this effort um, and, and provide our resources as, as a resource to others, uh, you know, would be happy to help, you know, and we could certainly kind of 
pull together some ideas from other cities, I think. Um, that's a really good idea. Some I haven't looked at yet. Are you offering to lead some kind of panel? Is that what you're doing, Zach? I'd be happy. Yeah, that sounds great. As long as Denise is there with us. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's talk about electrification for a moment as, as we move toward the electrification of New York City's building stock and transportation fleet. Um, Ellie, what role will solar and storage play in meeting this increased demand for electricity? We, we touched on it a bit, but let's, let's dive into a little bit deeper. Yeah, so late last year, the city passed Local Law 54, um, which basically phases out uh, fossil fuel connections and new buildings. So electrification's here, it's coming. Um, there's no sort of going, getting around that. It's it's going to be the, uh, the near future here. Um, the problem in New York City is that uh, heat pumps uh, in particular are usually more cost effective than say oil or electric, electric resistance heat, but that's not often the case with gas. Um, our gas is pretty cheap compared to our very high electricity prices. And that's a big problem. We've seen with um, the price spikes um, this past winter um, on electric bills is that that's a really big problem. And a lot of people can't simply can't afford for their electric bills to go up. So solar and storage by sort of find it or could be an excellent way to reduce those costs uh, and make sure that we are being able to provide clean heat to people without sort of overburdening them um, on their electric bills. And Denise, are there any lessons learned um, to other, maybe not just cities or states, but in other countries as your, your member list work in countries all around the world uh, when it comes to this new kind of electrification? Yes, I, you know, I think there, this idea and with respect to the, the cross section of um, vehicle grid, the V to G example, I think is a really big one um, that's developing outside of outside of New York and you know probably more across Europe. There's also um, this isn't as much in the electrification category, but storage as a transmission asset um, in lieu of new wires and big grid systems, um, storage act, acting as a transmission asset that's also happening in Europe. So there's some, there's some different, different use cases for storage that are happening outside of New York that are, that we're keeping our eye on. The electrification, um, the role of storage in that increasing electrification we see as a critical um, opportunity, you know, especially with respect to, you know, peak shaving, you know, the most effective use of electricity, you know, that time of use, you know, shift time shifting energy um, to help reduce the pressure on the grid and the need to, you know, actually put up more wires, um, as well as, you know, unnecessarily build generation. So that I think is a really interesting um, future that we're developing, but I don't think we're quite ready for it. So that, yeah. that's where that's where we see the you know the need for new tariffs that incentivize the behavior that we're looking for. This time of use rates type type of um, you know development of those types of rates and tariffs um, that you're rewarding um, residents as well as businesses for operating in a way that's going to take the pressure off the grid and use use solar when it's available or store solar for later use, things like that. Shim, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I honestly don't have anything really to add beyond what Ellie and Denise just said, because I think they they captured the entire picture when it comes, when it comes to, you know, solar plus storage and, and building electrification. You know, like Ellie said, um, and given the challenges with, the economics of, of heat pumps, you know, solar storage should have a, an important role to play. Um, and then, you know, the only, I guess the only thing I'll add, which is just repeating what I mentioned before is, you know, if you have um, sufficient critical mass of, of, of behind the meter storage on New York City's buildings installed, then at some point, you know, there is a huge opportunity in terms of being able to aggregate those systems to participate in either distributed or wholesale markets to provide system benefits. And, you know, as far as uh, Con Ed is concerned, again, you know, we are, we're, we're in the sort of BC era of that, you know, partly because 
we still I mean, we're still on the way to having indoor stores permitted. But once that happens, I think you know it. Pro and and given given that the tariffs, you know, or the mechanisms that compensate uh, those assets for for participating in, in that aggregate fashion are 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 you know are are uh, viable enough then that only uh, further improves the value proposition um, of, of installing solar and storage on buildings. And then again, you know, um, as Denise mentioned, and, and I mentioned, and Zach mentioned, your rate design is a really critical part of the puzzle. And when we say rate design, you know, the starting point is time of use or time varying pricing, right? Where right now, you know, we, for most part, uh, even, you know, customers that have adopted uh, rooftop solar and storage are on flat rates, um, and what you know, if you can provide price signals that more accurately reflect system conditions, um, and then you will have an, again, you know, further improved value proposition of installing rooftop solar and storage. And so, you know, we uh, again, we are like speaking for the, speaking for Nicera, we are in the you know initial stages of l looking at. You know what? What rate design options can a enable adoption, but then of course, you know, ultimately from the regulatory perspective, rate designs also need to be responsible with regard to cost recovery, um, and 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 uh, cost recovery equity. So um, it's pretty hard needle to thread. <laughs> that's what I'm finding out just in being part of initial conversations. But uh, that's not a you know that's not a reason to um, ultimately you know not land land there. It it may take some time, um, and you know New York is a very process driven uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, regulatory environment. But I don't think we have an option without without uh, rate design innovation. I quite honestly don't think we can really get to the end point in terms of a fully electrified uh, economy. You know, we, we hear from industry what they always like to see is, you know, something that they can count on, whether it's an incentive or whatever it is, they need some stabilization. It's just, there's so many things you cannot even predict. I mean, the pandemic and now what we have going on, which is interrupting the supply chain and costs and so forth. So what would you like to say, um, and, and Shiam, I'll go back to you, to the industry of how, how and, and you come from industry and you come from, from NYSEA before, of how can the installers, how can the industry prepare themselves for the next five years so they stay, you know, solid, so they can really keep it together and keep moving it. What, what would you like to say to the industry how they could prepare? I mean, quite honestly, uh, I, I don't really, you know, uh, <laughs> the industry is doing a great job doing what it's doing. I mean, I think um, the way I think of this, just being in my new seat, is it's really the state has some really tough uh, questions to answer in terms of balancing all the considerations, and that's something that I've had a you know a whole a new appreciation for now being involved on the inside or the last three to four months in, in my role at NYSERDA in terms of you know having to balance all the considerations we have to to uh, you know, in terms of actually implementing policy and programs. So, you know, and, and you know, so the industry, you know, um, correctly wants, uh, you know, wants robust, uh, you know, support in terms of market mechanisms slash incentives. It wants visibility, it wants transparency. It wants to know what's next, you know, well before, um, before the current round of incentives are allocated, which is again, quite frankly, not what happened. Right, it's not. Uh, we we ran out of uh, in incentives and community credit allocation for Con Ed, um, and then you know we were caught a little flat-footed in terms of what's next. And 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 quite honestly, you know, I, I will say that, and and this I, I did say this even at NICI, you know, that that's partly a victim of our own success. We, you know, we we burned through incentive allocations uh, faster than we thought, and you know, partly that's reflective of the fact that that. You know that the way we've structured the markets and the programs, uh, they've been working, and the, you know the uptake has been very robust. Again, much more robust than than uh, the state had anticipated. So you know, going forward, uh, I think we you know like that is not something we want to see again, where 
we run through this next round of incentives uh, you know, that have been proposed in the roadmap, again, fingers crossed it's actually approved because it's still, this is still a petition awaiting BSC approval. So I you know, shouldn't really get ahead of myself. Otherwise I can hear my DPS colleagues kind of you know, yelling in my ear right now as I say this. But uh, you know, let's just optimistically assume we, 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 we do have you know, the roadmap for you know, in, at, a, at a high level approved and, and, and you're able to put the incentives out on the street you know, there is a, there is a question uh, which we cannot get away from about well, what happens next, which is what Zach pointed to in his remarks at the beginning saying, you know, 10 gigawatts is great, but we need to go further than that. And so, um, you know, uh, that is something that um, the state and stakeholders need to collaborate on figuring out. I mean, uh, and, and ideally, uh, you know, again, I, this is just me speaking personally. Uh, so I, you know, please understand that, you know, my state hat is off. Uh, right now, but um, that process should begin, uh, you know, uh, sooner rather than later. Let me just say it that way, because you know the 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 way things are looking right now is you know the incentives will likely be allocated uh, pretty quickly, um, you know, if if the programs are designed properly, which for large part they are. So uh, we may be here in, in you know in a year or two years saying, hey, now what's next? You know, we've allocated incentives to get 10 gigawatts of solar. And I'm speaking just about solar here because we haven't even we've just embarked you know on the on the road mapping process the storage roadmap so I can't even tell you where we land, and Denise Denise also I think uh, can appreciate that, um, but you know when it comes so so um, when, so uh, so when it comes to whether it's incentives when it comes to revisiting uh, and improving the Veder tariff schema, I mean all those conversations ideally need to start happening. Um, pretty much in parallel with the implementation of the 10 gigawatt roadmap programs, right? Um, and that's where, um, you know, again, you know, it, it, uh, you know, there are there are quarters of the state that are quite rightly pointing out, okay, you know, how are we being a little presumptive in terms of saying, you know, let's start working on what's next before this, this proposal is even approved, you know, it's a little bit, it might sound like a little presumptuous, but um, and again, maybe I just, you know, this is a function of me being at the industry or working for the industry for three years, but I do think um, you know, if we want to provide visibility transparency, if we don't want to have a market pause, um, then it's important that that work begins uh, in parallel with the implementation of, of the 10 gigawatt roadmap. Well, thank you for that. I have to say that, you know, Tria Case, who, um, as you all know, Tria, uh, is the university executive director of um, sustainability and energy conservation, but she also formed the New York City Partnership back in 2005 and the Smart DG Hub. And, you know, we've come a, a long, long way. And, you know, Zach was just kind of uh, teasing a little bit about New York City it's being harder to do things there. But I think our installers are particularly resilient in New York City and they, um, they voiced their opinion. And I really think that that has helped move the market. And I see from our presentations today and our speakers in the panel, what a long way we've come since we started doing this 15 years ago. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, the agencies have heard what they have to say, uh, what, what the installers have to say. And we're gonna be sharing the survey with them. But, but Ellie, is there anything that you'd like to say to the installers as they come up with their own business plan for the next five years? and how the city um, is looking to support them. Yeah, um, I wanna to allude to something that Zach already mentioned. It's that he said that Nicaea is really looking towards uh, the disadvantaged communities mandate and taking that very seriously. I think that's an excellent move. I think that not only is that the right thing to do, that there's gonna be money behind that. So it seems like a good idea. And to that end, working with community-based organizations that can help you find sites and customers, but also can come together with you um, for advocacy and things like that. Um, sort of broaden that tent so that you have um, more power when you're pushing for policies or things like that. Um, so that's that's the main thing I would say. If uh, if everybody could stay on for maybe another five minutes because we got started just a little bit late. I got I have one more question that our team um, prepared a question for that. Um, just want to propose to all of you. The sustainable CUNY team, Smart DG Hub team, has been focused um, over the years. 
um, our, our focus has led to the development of the DG Hub, and that was after Hurricane San Sandy. And that big focus has been resiliency. Uh, and if anything, the last three, four, five years has taught us is to expect the unexpected. So uh, let's talk just for a moment about resiliency and how you see that playing a role going forward, both from a policy and an industry development perspective. And Zach, can, can we start with you um, with the focus on resiliency? Sure. Yeah, so you know, I think resiliency was a, a major reason why Long Island was a perfect place to start an ICERTA storage rebate program, and it's, it's been successful. Um, like as long as there's poles and wires to be damaged, you're going to have outages no matter how well you prepare, right? Um, so I think customers are getting more and more interested in these solutions uh, in storage, especially as the costs have come down and extreme weather is increasing. Um, so we need to expand support for storage, uh, not just in New York City, but statewide. Um, through the state tax credit, storage rebates, or other programs, um, you know, so that those benefits can be realized in New York City. Again, I'll, I guess I'll point to some other states. Um, I think, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire kind of all have storage programs that, that are aimed at protecting the ratepayers while providing resiliency for the homeowner. And I think that's kind of the ultimate goal. Of our, of our programs. Of course, I'll, I'll let Denise correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, microgrids and aggregation, peak shaving, um, energy efficiency paired with DG solutions. Um, and, you know, I guess one route to get there is AMI. Like we're going to need advanced meters to effectively deploy this. So that would be a good place to start or make sure that we're, we're ahead of that game a little bit as these other things start to fall in place. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Denise, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just, I would say that, you know, beyond, you know, Zach kind of talked about a more residential level, I think. And, you know, so just looking at it from a, you know, even if you take it to a microgrid type of, there's still a lot of opportunity. I, I think about where we were after Hurricane Sandy and, you know, um, New York Best was on some of the governor's, you um, task forces afterwards and everything was all about, you know, we're going to develop these microgrids. And I feel like we haven't like the, the direction, then we went to, you know, rev and rev was everything and was it distributed everything. And that was the way to do every, that's the direction we were going to go. And, and now we have the climate act and um, these are all great initiatives. Right. And, but now it's all about the big stuff. We got to get big stuff on the grid. But I think when you take it back to the resilience piece, um, it's, it's really looking at how do we, in, in the event, if there's another hurricane Sandy, are we prepared? I think that's a great question to ask. And, you know, what are we doing? Because the reality of climate change is that we are likely to have more events and, you know, and we need to be thinking about that ahead of the time instead of waiting. One, one thing from a policy perspective is there's not really, um, it's not built into any of our programs, right? There's not, there's not a compensation for resilience built into anything. There's no, how do you monetize the a resilience aspect? And I think that's something that's been, you know, people have been scratching their head around for a while. So some of these programs, to the extent that that's what it's driving towards, that's, that's a, I think, a really good and valid goal. Um, so, uh, you know, we obviously look forward to continuing to try to work on those things. And I do think, you know, programs that look at specifically the vehicle to grid piece is a is a great opportunity to build in resilience where you know as we as we deploy more EVs across the state and across the country you've got a battery sitting in in your garage or out on the street that could potentially be used to help power your your home so building in pro, you know building in that kind of thinking and and um, you know incentivizing that kind of behavior developing that kind of technology is, I think, really the, the types of things that reinforce that message of resilience. And I'll just, I'll just layer in one more thing you know, on, on top of, kind of everything that's been said and agree with it all. So we were just part of a recent local Solar for All New York study. Um, mm -hmm. And Shyam will be familiar with this. It, it started back in, in his days. 
Um, you know, it showed that while, while we do need a lot of utility scale clean resources, we also need significant amounts of distributed solar um, and really solar and storage. And that's how we optimize the system. And that's how it's most cost effective, um, you know, way, way more than we're currently planning for. So as much as we want to monetize this, really, you know, just by doing it, we're saving the state money. We're saving ratepayers money. Um, our, our studies show billions and billions of dollars uh, could be saved by deploying additional distributed solar plus storage resources to help with these issues. Yeah, and that's exactly it, Zach and Denise. You talk about the pink elephant in the room is that how do you monetize it? And we've been, you know, tapping on the door of insurance companies for years now. And there's a study that we did exactly on this. It's up on our website. Um, we did with NREL and, and a few others uh, on the value of resiliency. So I think that they're listening now. Um, but then, like, there's other ways, you know, that uh, CUNY has its own vehicle to grid project going up right now as we speak. So there's, you know, what was started out as pilot projects, we know, we all hope that then very soon become more of the norm. Um, so, and, and I remember, I mean, almost 10 years now for Hurricane Sandy. And I remember after it that CUNY pulled together a meeting that, you know, they came, you know, the, the Department of Defense came, all the utility companies came, NYSERDA, the city, everybody, you know, New York Best, you know, so on was there. And at that time, there wasn't even the right kind of inverters in the United States market. Uh, and now, and then there was an inverter meeting and they all came and now they're in the market. So I think that you know, when you when you raise that flag and say we need to pay attention to this, hopefully, eventually they do before there is another a disaster. And so, Ellie, um, bringing this around to um, integrating resiliency more into these policies, um, you know, it, they they get paid attention to when there's that disaster, and then they kind of just there's other disasters that come in, into the front burner. We're definitely still, uh, Hurricane Ida is still very much front of mind here. Um, that was really not that long ago um, and was pretty devastating. Mm -hmm. People died. It was really awful. Um, so, you know, we know these things are going to happen. And actually, this particular administration changed the name of our office um, to reflect that fact. So you may Ooh. have seen the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in the past, you know, I still, I worked at the Mayor's Office of Sustainability that has become engulfed in this Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. And we're integrating resiliency and sustainability teams fully. Um, no, none of them are going to be separated in any way. All of our policies will have to advance both, and they will also have to advance, advance uh, environmental justice. That's sort of the new mandate and the new vision of this administration. So we will be sort of releasing our strategic plans over the next year or so. And I think you will see that uh, sustainability and resiliency would be fully integrated uh, in those plans. Thank you, Ellie. And Shiam, if you can wrap up in another minute or two about resiliency into the state plans. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my uh, fellow panelists really covered the covered the gamut. I mean, to me, it just really comes down to um, very narrowly uh, needing, you know, programmatic or regulatory uh, recognition for the value that storage provides uh, in terms of resiliency. So we need that established ideally, you know, in terms of a, a market, uh, from a market model perspective, if not from a programmatic support perspective uh, to really recognize the value of storage uh, as resiliency asset so that, um, you know, so, 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 so that it, it, it uh, uh, towards actually getting more of it built. I want to thank um, our panelists very much for joining us today. Uh, Shiam and Denise and Ellie and Zach, really appreciate the time. And as you saw earlier, we, we had questions um, of our audience about policy. So we will, be we will be forwarding all of those to you so you can see what is the concerns of this industry. We had over uh, 300 sign up for today's um, for today's workshop and 
sometimes you don't get the full number, but I don't know about you, but sometimes I sign up for a workshop and then I just go get the slides later because I know they'll send them to me <laughs> if my schedule gets busy. So we have a lot of people in the business that um, really gonna have a chance. And in fact, it's gonna be their turn again right now. We are, we've got another survey, a little bit of a longer one. Thank you very much again for our panel. Um, Ron is putting up the screen right now, but once again, go to the Q&A section in your Zoom. This is your turn now um, to our attendees. This is a little bit longer of a survey. There are some new nuanced questions at the top. So please go to that survey that's in the Q&A of your screen. Come back to the Zoom screen if you've been elsewhere. Um, click on the Q&A or the more if you can't see the Q&A and you should be able to get to it. We're not quite done yet. So this is a little bit longer of a survey, as I said. It, and if you notice, um, if you scroll down, you're going to you get to the part where you saw the earlier questions. You can just, once you answer the top ones, you can skip on ahead and just hit submit. Uh, if you did not get a chance to uh, answer any of those earlier survey questions, you can do that now and then, and then hit submit. And we'll also be sending this out to, uh, to all of you who registered, because we wanna make sure that we, we know what is on your mind, what your challenges are. Um, we'll take uh, any of your praise. There was a lot of praise for our presenters today for how, uh, how much help they have been in many ways and for the presentations. Uh, I hope you're all over doing that um, survey right now. And then we'll have a quick wrap up from Tria Case in just a moment. And I want to give everybody a minute to get over to that. And there's, there's four or five questions at the top there. I might be able to even put it up myself. I don't know. Ron, you can put it up maybe if you can. Uh, yeah, I'm trying, having a little technical difficulty on my end, but working on it. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without a technical difficulty, right? We do thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Uh, and we will be sending out a link once we post all the presentations. I'll post them individually by agency and then the entire webinar will also be up on our webinar page. Try to make it as easy as possible for you to get the information that you need, slides that you need, the questions and answers. Um, once we gather those, we send them off to the agency. We don't always wait for all of the answers to come in before we start posting them because some take a little bit longer than others uh, to get back um, if they're diving in. And I see we now have Tria with us. Here I am. All right, Ron, thank you. We'll just go to Tria. Okay. That. Um, so I do want to pass it to Tria Case. As I mentioned, she is the University Executive Director of Sustainability and Energy Conservation, as well as the initiator of the New York City Solar Partnership back in 2005, the founder of the Smart DG Hub, and a person I think that has been the biggest driver behind building the foundation mm -hmm. for a sustainable solar and storage market in New York City. So um, leaving it to you, Tria, to wrap us up for the day. Hey, Lori, thank you. And thank you everybody for spending the whole day with us. There was a, a lot of information shared today. And, um, you know, we, we, we established the DG Hub really to bring together all the stakeholders to support a transition to renewable and distributed energy and to ensure a resilient future. And the conversation we just heard was, was really um, a great uh, example of, of what we try to do. And, and I'm really happy to see this work as a webinar. Um, you know, that as Lori said, there were, there were a whole lot of people who registered who will get the recording if they didn't make it, but a lot of people made it today and stayed, many of you have, have stayed on all the way through. Um, we do hope to see you again though next year at the Con Ed Training Center. And with that in mind, I also wanna thank Con Ed for partnering with us once again to um, put this workshop together. Um, it is a really important part of our, of our partnership and, and we hope we're providing you all with what you need to support deployment in the solar and storage market. I also wanna thank all the agencies who pre presented today. 
but also to each one of them specifically for all the work that they've been doing with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, they, they hear from us regularly and, you know, each one of you are an important part of making all this work. And, and the panel that you just heard from, um, you know, your insights and your work are instrumental and we really look forward to continuing our work with all of you. So, um, you know, as, as I close, I, I also want to congratulate the DG Hub team on a successful day today, but also on the important work that you're all doing. You know, your, your work, and I don't get a chance to say this enough, your work day to day helps the city, helps the state uh, to be less reliant on fossil fuels, and it helps us to meet our solar and storage goals. So, you know, thank you for pay paying attention to every single detail and helping us to put this together and being able to present this today to all of our participants. And again, you know, thank you to all of our participants for taking the time today to both share and learn. You know, thanks for taking the time to fill out these surveys. The surveys that we get from you, these roundtables and the information that you provide is really what helps us gear um, our work, uh, you know, day to day and year over year. And it's, it's been amazing to me each year how um, your responses um, have have truly you know mirrored what's happening in the marketplace and helped us to be able to gear um, our efforts. Uh, again, we're going to post everything that you uh, heard today on the NY Solar Map. Um, but if you didn't hear it today, if there's something you want to know, please reach out to us. Our ombudsman are here, uh, Smart DG Hub, uh, CUNY.edu. We look forward to continued work with all of you. Let's keep talking. Um, I'm really proud of the progress uh, we've all made together, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you. And I think we're done. And we are, Lori, I'll, I'll throw it back to you to, to close us out. <laughs> We'll leave, we'll leave the links open as long as you uh, need for um, filling out the survey. And as I mentioned, we will be sending them to you. And a lot of questions about people are asking, when are you going to post? When are you going to post? Next couple of uh, business days, we'll get it up. And we've got to um, pare down the webinar a little bit through to size. But the presentations will go up the decks as soon as as soon as I can and it's separately. So you can go right to the agency you want to look at and you can zoom in on all those drawings from the FDNY. We had a lot of great comments from people saying how helpful um, they were. So thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Lori, once again for being such an amazing facilitator. <laughs>